Hello, and welcome to Jason Kavner's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Kavner's. Guest today is Mariah Smith, Vice Chairman of the nonprofit No One Left Behind. Mariah, thanks for being here today. Great. Thanks for having me on the show. So first off, tell us about the story of Bunny the Kitten. Oh, wow. You're leading you weren't expecting that, were you? I wasn't. And <laughs> hey, that's one of my favorite topics. So thanks for starting with that. Um, Bunny the Kitten. Um, so when I was in Afghanistan uh, as a military police officer in 2010, it was my second tour, um, and I was at uh, Camp Eggers in Kabul. Uh, and my dad was actually on that tour with me. He was there as an Army civilian serving also in, in Kabul. In the same location? In the same location. He was at a different camp, but we still got to see each other um, like every week or every other week. Um, well, I've always loved animals, and I'm still involved in uh fostering kittens and volunteering at uh, our local shelter back home. And a kitten was born, uh, a litter of kittens, uh, under our housing area. And so my roommate Tammy and I uh, started to feed the kittens, you know, and just interact with them, you know, bring them some chicken or tuna back from the chow hall. And it was a way for me, you know, it was a way to stay connected with animals and just a way to, to unwind at the end of the workday. Um, and I grew really attached to this one kitten. Um, and I ended up naming her Bunny because she looked like a little wild bunny. You know, she had kind of that brown, gray, marled coat. coat. Um, and as the tour came to a close, um, I worried about what would happen to her. You know, it's not an easy life for street cats, you know. Anywhere, um, much, anywhere less Afghanistan. Much, less, <laughs> much less Afghanistan. Um, and so... Uh, Tammy helped me find uh, the one animal shelter in Kabul um, that was that would take in animals and would be able to vaccinate them, uh, fix them, you know, provide them with travel papers. And then I got in touch with the organization Puppy Rescue Mission, uh, which has been helping soldiers mainly bring home dogs they find for years from overseas. But they also they help out with cats every now and then, too. And they had the connections uh, to get Bunny home. So as my tour drew to a close, the animal shelter picked her up, gave her all her vaccinations, fixed her, brought her back out to me to, you know, make sure like, all right, get her ready for travel. And then um, she flew back to the States just by coincidence, the same day that I was flying back. Um, and so I was able to pick her up at Dulles Airport. Um, and she's 14 years old today. Uh, she's she's still alive and kicking at the farm at Traveler's Rest. And my mother and I are writing a children's book about her. Nice. So it wasn't like you use your MP connections. Hey, hey, customs, don't look at my bag, you know. <laughs> In fact, I paid uh, $2,000, over $2,000 to bring her home legally, which sounds crazy when there's so many uh, cats, uh, you know, in America that need homes. Um, but she was a really important part of my tour. Uh, it was Christmas day that, um, the shelter picked her up and my dad was with me and like, you know, uh, we were talking to the guards and everything and, and um, talking to the, the vet that came out from the shelter, the, the Afghan vet. And, um, yeah, so no, I, I went through all the legal channels to, to bring yeah, a pet that's, home. That's a great story. How long do cats live? Um, on average? Have, on average, they live about 15 to 17 okay. years. So, so bunny is a senior citizen now. Um, she has been a, um, uh, great grandmother for for foster great grandmother for many litters of foster kittens that have come through uh, Traveler's Rest Farm and then gone on to uh, to their forever homes. So how long were you was your dad with you in Kabul? He was also on a one year tour and we overlapped. I think he got there in the summer of 2010 and I had arrived in February of 2010. Um, and he was working. Um, he was uh, work over on the U.S. For Forces Alpha. US4A camp, um, doing vendor vetting and looking at where um, the money that the US was spending on, you know, construction projects and vendors that we hired, like tracing where that was going to make sure that it wasn't going, you know, in fact, corruption to, and stuff. Exact, yeah. to corruption and bad actors. Uh, he's had a whole career in the Navy. Um, he didn't happen to serve in Afghanistan when he was still on active duty. So um, after I had gone a couple times, that was my fifth deployment overall in my second tour to Afghanistan, uh, dad was like, well, I'm going too. So. So I can see that being a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing. Cause you know, you're both there, but it has to, I don't think it'd be bad because man, like you're right there, you're worrying, like, you I mean, like, 
like obviously your dad can't come check on you every day or that kind of right. stuff or like hey and you know obviously he can't kind of go to your 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 boss hey you're not treating my daughter right you know so it had to be like i don't know i don't know if i want to do that with my daughter being or my parents right you're kind of like up close and like realizing exactly what yeah, like day to day yeah um thankfully i had a wonderful boss yeah. and uh and so that wasn't an issue and and he came over to many of our events at nato okay. training mission afghanistan but as far as the threat i mean even though that tour in kabul you know, it was much safer than the tour I had done previously with the 82nd Airborne out in Coast Province. Um, you know, there's still uh, vehicle uh, yeah. born IEDs, you know, suicide bombers. Um, the transport that he would take back and forth between his camp and mine, uh, the Rhino uh, got hit a few times by uh, VBIDs. Thankfully, not when he was win yeah. in it. But um, so, yeah, there was there was definitely big risk there. And then having two family members. Are you, are you like, Dad, you've done your time. What are you doing over here? Right. Like, he still had more in him. He was, uh, yep. Like, go do something else. <laughs> no, it was a wonderful experience. I'm really glad we got to do it together. Nice. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about your farm. Is it a farm or a ranch? What do you consider? Uh, Virginia, we say farm. Okay. I feel like ranch is more of like a, you know, Texas slash west of the Mississippi okay. thing. So we have to talk about your bees. Like, yes. do you raise bees? Like, you grow honey? You do the whole nine yards, so to speak? I do. And let me tell you and that. Do you sell the honey, too? I haven't produced enough to sell it yet, but I like to give it but away as good. gifts. Yes, okay. Yeah, and, and then enough for, like, our family. Um, So I got into beekeeping three years ago, and I took a class for it, Um, you know, offered through, like, the county extension service. Um, My mom took the class with me and got set up with two beehives. And I did not expect it to be as fascinating as it has been and there was also another surprising connection um there's like a whole it for some reason unlocked this interest in like spirituality and philosophy for me because there's a lot of people and authors that look at the intelligent design of beehives and you know the way those um the way the hive works um just as you know it's 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 a fascinating um, microcosm, you know, and it's a um, it's a super organism, they call it, because the hive itself is a type of colony, is a type of organism. Um, and then each individual bee, you know, is, is its own, you know, entity itself. And so. I'm guessing they treat you like a friend, like I'm, like you go in there, take bee honey away and stuff that I like, leave you alone, like they, they know who you are or they. Like, no, you, you, they're like, no, she's taking our stuff from us. They do. They do get used to their beekeeper. Um, so it's not as disruptive to the bees as you would think. Um, really experienced beekeepers that have been doing it for many, many years. Those are the ones that you see will like operate without like a glove or veils on. Um, I still tend to use, I not tend to use, I do use the protective equipment because I'm still fairly new to it, which is the, the veil, the jacket, and then the gloves and then long pants, of course. I've been stung a few times, but um, as long as you're gentle and kind of move, and it's it's also like you have to go into that handling your bees with the right frame of mind. Like you have to be patient. You have to be in a good mood. You know, like you can't be exuding anxiety um, because they're going to sense that. Um, and you use things like um, you've seen the beekeeper like smokers, um, stuff like that to like calm them. That helps with the pheromones that they give off that would otherwise be for like, hey, you know, it's cause for alarm, like a predator's in our hive or yeah. something. Um, and all those things, you know, help keep them calm enough. Um, and then also being respectful about the amount of honey that you're going to take out and yeah. the time of year that you do it. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the, our first rabbit hole, right? So about a month ago, they did, they, did, they did a thing on TV where they found this egg calendar, egg calendar right? Yeah. It was like, this, it was humongous, right? miles and miles. And they and they were pretty anti like like farms everything storage right like really planned right, and the scientists were saying like it's this instinct it's not creative design it's animals right yeah I mean I'm thinking like are you are you is you are you are you sure this thing like intelligence right here like are you right, really yeah like so do you believe like like bees and ants they're like intelligent beings like yes not of course not to all level but there's yeah. level there's a beautiful book called um Song of Increase that talks. <laughs> For the Imperial Death March, interrupt our <laughs> peaceful beekeeper talk. <laughs> yeah, that's my Aunt Carol calling, but she's fine. I don't know why. I, sometimes my focus, my phone works. Sometimes it doesn't, which is crazy to me. Right. Yeah. 
Um, no, but speaking about, uh, you know, the intelligence that, you know, these types of, of animals have, um, Song of Increase talks about, you know, they've studied the different types of hums and song patterns that bees do that communicate. Um, and I think ants communicate in a way also. So how long have you had this farm? Uh, we bought, it's called Traveler's Rest, and we bought it in 2016 um, as a family. I bought it with my parents and my brother as a vacation place. And then um, when I was retiring from the Army in 2020, um, I was able to move out there full time. So I've lived out there full time for just over four years now, um, right as I was separating from the Army. Um, but we've had it for eight years. And so, like, is a plan event, like, make this like a money making operation for yourself? Um. <laughs> No, because uh, I feel like as anyone who owns horses would tell you, there's like, <laughs> unless you own the Derby winner, there's like no making money in horses. Okay. You're just spending money. Um, so no, it's it's a it's a homestead. It's a hobby farm uh, for the family and and for friends that are visiting. And uh, we'll get to about everything else you're doing too. But everything else you're doing, do you get do you, do you get to spend enough time on your farm like you want? Like you actually like get to chill on a weekend, ride your horses, and like have a good time, or is it, like more like once in a blue moon? I stay pretty busy, but I. And so it, so to answer your question, like, no, I don't get like the full amount of time there. I would love to like really do all the projects I want to do, but I've gotten a little bit better in the past year or two about being intentional about taking time, like on weekends, like in, instead of overscheduling myself socially or with, um, you know, I like to play polo, you know, or like, you know, being gone all day, like on the polo field, like. Instead, spending time on the farm, you know, spending time there with my parents, you know, having friends over, just spending time with the animals uh, and working on projects at home. And I feel like that balances me a lot better and like puts me in the right frame of mind than to like work all week. So do you still consider yourself a quote unquote country girl or city girl? Country girl. Country girl. For sure. You always been like that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I come from uh, a family of... Um, uh, country folks, I would say, <laughs> and um, yeah, no, there's, there's nothing like country you live in, right? Exactly, you know. And then had a, I rode horses, started riding when I was four, um, and just absolutely have loved spending out time outside my entire life. That's that's been a constant. So next, talk about your time volunteering at this Humane Foundation, fostering kittens. Yeah. So why kittens versus dogs? Any certain reason for that? Um, face wise, it's a little easier. I am admittedly a cat lady. Like I, I love all animals. Dogs are great. Um, but like, I love cats. Um, and lifestyle wise, like for fostering cats and partic in particular fostering kittens and neonatal kittens, which are kittens that are still, um, nursing or just weaning and just learning to eat solid food, but they would still need their mother, you know, normally are the most euthanized animals that get turned into animal shelters because every spring and summer there are just hundreds of thousands of kittens born that are either found or their mothers are killed or like they can't manage the population because they're born you know in a neighborhood or whatever um and so the only way to you know save some of these kittens and turn them into pets is um if you have a network of fosters because most shelters are at capacity. They don't have overnight staff. Um, and so you can get set up as a foster with just like, you know, a little space that's like six foot by six foot, you know, you can buy a pet playpen, buy some supplies. Um, if you're bottle feeding kittens, you need to be with them every couple of hours. But if they're slightly older kittens, I mean, you can go to work all day and come back and check on them and socializing them, you know, they kind of teach themselves to use a litter box they can be turned into well-socialized pets ready for adoption within just a few weeks. And it's really rewarding. I have tons of friends and family that have adopted kittens for me that I now get to see them, you know, follow them on Instagram as like family pets. Um, it's really rewarding to see people, you know, come and like meet their family pet, pick them out, you know, and then have a lot of long years with them. So with the stuff you mean society, how do you keep from getting so like personally involved, right? Cause you have to get like, I'm sure you, you see like animals not get adopted, been there for a long time. Like, how do you, how do you handle that on a personal level? Yeah, it's, um, I, it is sometimes heartbreaking, you know, where you see, um, you know, cause you can't help them all. Um, you just try and make a difference with the ones that you can. Um, and so then it's just, it's a matter of focusing on the good and what you can do. 
because it is incredibly sad and overwhelming when you think about all these populations, you know, that aren't being helped or, you know, there just isn't enough help available for them or, you know, bad things happen to, you know, innocent animals. Um, so yeah, it's, it's making a difference where you can. Is there such a thing as like an unadoptable pet? Is it like maybe a pet's been there for so long, can't get adopted, or maybe they're like have only two legs or there's something wrong with the pet. Like, yeah. is such a thing as unadoptable? Um, I won't say unadoptable. I will say some are have more specific needs for the right home than maybe some other pets. Um, so like cats that are appropriate for like a barn type situation. Um, I have a wonderful cat that came from Middleburg Humane Foundation. Um, where he was, he was an older adult cat. Um, he's a big cat. He's all black. Um, and he's suitable to being, I mean, like he likes to be outside and roaming around. And so he can have a safe life on my farm as an indoor outdoor cat. Um, so no, I think, I, I don't think there's any that are unadoptable. Um, it's just finding the right circumstances uh, for them. So I might be make this up. I remember hearing somewhere that each cat kills like 20 birds or 20 rats per year or something like that. So the, there, there is, um, what, yes. So not, I mean, I don't know if that's the correct statistic, yeah, correct. but, but, um, as far as domestic cats killing songbirds, that is an issue. And that's one of the reasons, and it's not just safety for the cats themselves, but for, you know, people advocate mainly to have indoor only cats. And it's to prevent, you know, the killing of songbirds because um, cats are fantastic predators. I mean, they're come from the big cat family, right? Exactly. I mean, and they eat that stuff is still in their bloodline. Or, you know, it's like, in their bloodline. They, like they're, you know, they don't just kill when they're hungry. Um, so, yeah, that's that's just one of the reasons why, you know, so many people, you know, so many people advocate for like keeping your cats indoor only. And I think on like my situation where I have a large farm where I've got a couple barns and where he's he like my barn cat actively helps with the rodent population, maybe not as much as I would like. <laughs> he could do a little more hunting in my opinion. Um, maybe I'm feeding him too well. Um, but yeah, that that's, that's an issue. And that's something to consider when you're looking at, you know, like people and different types of animals all cohabitating in the same environment. But it's not like, I could be wrong again. It's not like these birds are like hunting these songbirds out of extinction, right? There's still a lot of song, songbirds, right? Right. I, I don't think, I don't think it's like creating an extinction issue. Okay. Yeah, it's just, I mean, you know. You're like, damn, damn, Fluffy, how many cats, how many birds are you going to kill today? Yeah, I understand, you know, like, people with their homes, you know, in their, in their yards, like, are enjoying, you know, birds coming to the feeder and everything, and but also, like, you're. random you're, dead birds in the yard. Yeah. Having, having birds. That would be upsetting, yes. <laughs> yeah. So, do you ever see this meme? I, I saw this a while ago. And it's like, you know, there was this battle cat person, dog person, right? And the meme, there's a group of cats, right? And the meme was like, hey, we're, we're not your best friend. But we're gonna we're not gonna tell the cop for your drugs are right either, right? <laughs> yeah, cats aren't snitches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you know, cats have cats have got the right attitude. Like, you know, like yeah. so. so how long have you been involved with the Humane Society? I started fostering when I was still in the army. Okay. And I was living uh in Northern Virginia in Crystal City, right near the Pentagon. I was finishing up my um final assignment. I was uh legislative affairs for central command. And so I had this apartment and I would, I could walk to the Pentagon and I had bunny in the apartment with me and I had been wanting to, to volunteer with an animal shelter for a long time. And so I, uh, talked to at the, the local one there was the animal welfare league of Arlington. Great organization. Um, they have a very robust foster program. They rescue, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of cats and kittens every year. Um, so I met them and got involved with them because you can foster kittens in an apartment also. Um, you know, you just need that small area. Yeah, you're and, not fostering like a pit bull in an apartment. Exactly. Yeah. Like the, the, well, at you least know, hopefully you're not right. The property managers, it was a pet friendly building. You know, they had no objections to like the little playpen of kittens, you know, in my apartment. So how many books have you written? I have not written any books. I've had a few published um, essays with a wonderful organization called So Say We All. And I had a um, essay published in the Wrathbearing Tree last year. Um, Mom and I are writing this children's book. And then I'm currently in the uh, in the Stanford Continuing Education Novel Writing Program. And I'm working on my first novel. So what you got interested in writing? I've written my whole life. Like I, I could find journals from when I was like seven, where I was trying to like scroll down story ideas and dreams and and stuff like that 
I think it's something you, that people are, you know, born with. It's part of the like creative spirit. So talk more about this children's, children's book. Is it be based on the life of Bunny, you said? Yes. Yeah. And my mom is the primary author. Um, and she and I do a lot of consulting on like the story and, you know, the actual, you know, the events and like how to communicate that to children and like, you know, what's appropriate history wise and like for the reality of soldiers that are deployed, but also keeping it, you know, child friendly. Um, it's called Bringing Bunny Back. Um, she just completed the first draft. So we're working on like editing and making choices about how we would want to publish it, you know, what we want to do for like illustrations, that type of thing. All right. I'm going to show you this picture, right? Yeah. So what would you do if you woke up and you saw this? <laughs> All right. So the picture is of what looks to be like a Maine Coon cat, like a long haired cat sitting like a very creepy doll on a dresser. <laughs> and, um, with it with its like legs like a human like sitting yeah, the like, way i'm like sitting this, on the this, chair this, right this now cat's freaking possessed right yeah so um that cat, that cat might have to leave my house <laughs> looks like that could be like an entity impersonating a cat yeah um, <laughs> that's actually what um so not sitting in a in a alarming way like that but bunny looks very similar to that she's like a long haired yeah, she... uh gray and brown cat like that nice nice yeah um so one thing you're, you're passionate, so you're passionate about um, diverse communities, promoting human rights and fostering collaboration and innovation. Can you talk about yeah. why you're so passionate about those things and how you go about living those values every day? Uh, yeah, I certainly will. Um, so I'm passionate about those things because I feel like that is the best of the experience that I had in the military. You know, that I spent 20 years in the army. Um, you know, those are incredibly formative years, you know, deployed a lot, um, saw a lot of the world, worked with a lot of different, you know, people from, you know, all different um, countries, nationalities, different militaries. Um, and which is why I chose when I left the uh, army to become involved in No One Left Behind. Um, because I- oh, Did they recruit you or you reach out to them? Uh, they recruited for board members in 2019. Uh, the organization was growing and they were looking for new board members. We were a much smaller organization at the time. Um, and so they reached out through a DC based think tank um, that I was connected with um, to recruit for new board members. And so I applied that way because I saw it as a way um, to really stay involved with our allies, um, to be involved in this, you know, merit based immigration, you know, uh, Bring, you know, this promise that we made to our allies um, that if they worked with the U.S. government, you know, they earned uh, a visa to come to the U.S. Uh, and restart their lives. So, question for you. How do y'all make sure you keep your admin costs down, right? Because, like, you look at their website, Slack is actually, there's like 20,000 people on the board, 20,000 people in the company, yeah. you know, like, and first, someone said, man, they must all get six-figure salaries. They're all, like, you know, accomplished people. They're not going to do it for free or do it part-time. They're getting paid good money. So when someone says, hey, I want to donate or support my man, I just think too much is going to admin costs. What's your yeah. point? So our board is all volunteer. None of the board members and none of the senior advisors um, draw get a single, you know, get any type of compensation. So it's all volunteer for us. And for years, the board was the staff of the organization. And that's how we kept admin costs down because it was a purely based volunteer organization. Um, as we've been able to grow, we've been able to hire full-time staff. And we've also always operated off the, the model of our Afghan and Iraqi ambassadors in the community um, who are 10, 1099 employees. Um, and they're the ones that, are, that really have that understanding and depth of reach in the community to help with um, resettlement programs, you know, with people that are restarting their lives here, the type of assistance they need. Um, so for keeping admin costs down, like we don't have a office or a facility. We just rent a very small glass cubicle in like a shared workspace so that we have like a single desk for people to go or we can rent a conference room if we need something. Uh, for board meetings, it's always donated space, that type of thing. Um, so we work really, really hard to keep our admin costs down um, so that the majority of the funds are focused on helping people leave Afghanistan um, and people start their lives here. And how do y'all like fundraise? Like does certain does certain person give the same money all, every year? Do you have to like quote unquote, big for money every year to make sure you have operating costs. How does that work? So fundraising is a never ending task. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, that nonprofits rightfully spend a great amount of time and focus on doing it well. Um, our approach is, you know, a varied approach. We have 
um, mailing campaigns, email campaigns, you know, and every donation matters. So there's, you know, the folks who at the end of the year are donating $10. Um, there's recurring donors who are making small, you know, donations every month. And then there have been larger donors that are partners that may, may be recurring. They may make a donation, a large donation um, repeatedly, or they may make a one-time donation. Um, and that's about developing those relationships and, you know, showing them, hey, here's the value of what we're doing. We're helping, you know, these people that we have an obligation to because they already made this commitment and did this work with the U.S. government. And the benefit of helping them relocate to the U.S., like, the country is better for it. Like, economically, you know, they just thrive once they're here and get their feet on the ground um, and then become, you know, incredible contributors to the communities that they're in. So it's a benefit, you know, to bring these talented people to the U.S. and, you know, ha help them become new Americans. So sort of the same way when the Vietnam War ended, all the Vietnamese people came over, right? Basically the same concept, right? Yes, there is a lot of similarity between uh, the Vietnamese community leaving there and restarting their lives here and uh, and the Afghan community and the Iraqi community uh, restarting here also after conflict. So I went to Vietnam for a bit, so for instance, September, I went to what they call them, they're, of course, called the American War Museum. Yeah. And it's like all the stuff we left behind, right? Like all the stuff like, man, this, this, so this is a pattern, right? Like we just leave stuff behind. It's like, man, this is insane. Yeah. I've seen the, um, I've seen the footage of like helicopters being pushed off carriers, like to make room for like more inbound aircraft, mm -hmm. those types, as you know, as, as the departure from Vietnam happened, you know, and then similarly, the, the equipment that was left behind by the U.S. Um, when we departed Afghanistan. Yeah. So next, this is kind of a, a actually, it's not it's like it is a sad story. Um, and I found this, I think on the website, I saw, I saw a link to somewhere, where it was, um, it was some sources, former U.S. Embassy employee in Kabul dies on a Taliban torture. Relatives of Ahmed Farid or Frani, I probably messed that name up. Do you know anything about that story that you can talk about? Um, speaking in general our generalities to pre preserve, you know, that that person and their family's, um, you know, privacy. But the people that have remained in Afghanistan that worked with the U.S. government or that worked under the former Afghan government are still at incredible risk. Um, there are many stories like that of torture, of murder, of uh, beatings, um, or just even simply not being able to work now and not being able to provide for their families, um, you know, makes it incredibly difficult uh, to survive there. Yeah, it just, it's, it's just insane, right? I mean, like, I think most people knew that we should have pulled out, like, probably maybe 10 years or even 20 years before, right? I mean, the amount of money lost, all that kind of stuff, right? The pull out how we did is like, man, are, are you kidding me right now? Like, I think anyone, anyone who's still there, like, it was like a punch of the gut, so to speak, right? It and, was. And we all knew people was like, man, like, Where's my, I don't know, I hope my guy's safe, right? He did so much for us. It's like, and then it's like the next day, it's like, yeah, it's just, yeah, it was insanity. Watching the events of the withdrawal in August of 21 was, you know, and I get emotional thinking about it, was one of the worst things that I've yeah. ever witnessed. And particularly being a veteran of Afghanistan, you know, and having so many friends that are like there, that came from there, relationships, stuff. you know, so many of my formative years were there working with people, both Afghan and American that lost their lives, you know, in this effort, um, you know, to rebuild this country. Um, so to see how we did it was so embarrassing and, and just, it was, it was tragic. And, but it was also one of the times when I'm like most proud of the effort that I was a small piece of. Um, and, you know, just as no one left behind, thousands of veterans, hundreds of other charitable organizations got involved in helping people evacuate um, in that chaos um, and being able to be part of doing something, even if it was a small piece of something, to try and change or affect something that I thought wasn't right um, was like the only way to get through it and like the only thing that like makes it bearable now. Is there a stat out there phone like, you know, like, we may able to like get out twenty five percent of the Afghan allies, anything like that. Are there any numbers of stats that you? There are go? still tens of thousands that are left there. Um, percentage wise, I'm not exactly sure like how many we were able to get out. Um, I would say it's probably akin to twenty five percent or so. There are still tens of thousands of people who are eligible for a special immigrant visa and their families that are waiting for their paperwork and their visa processing to be finished 
and then to allow them to come to the United States. And it's the choke point of our own process, our own U.S. government process um, of finalizing this for them, because it, it is a overly complicated process. I mean, and I understand like when you're, you know, looking at, you know, a green card visa program like this, it, it needs to be thorough. Um, but there are so many moving pieces to the special immigrant visa process that uh, No One Left Behind has always advocated for ways to make this process uh, smoother and, and to work and to com be completed faster because people will wait years for their visa to be finished and for them I to mean, be allowed to leave. I mean, it's thing they would be like, hey, like an Afghan ally or translator would say, hey, Jason, I need your letter of recommendation. Send a letter yeah. of recommendation to someone and maybe two or three people. Yeah, I know this guy. He's who he says he is, but I'm guessing it's more complicated than that. Well, and it's it's hard for folks to if, you know, they're trying to recreate some paperwork for a contract that they may have had 10, 12 years ago. Like, how difficult is it for them to track down their American supervisor, whether that was a military person or whether that's someone from a, um, you know, a large uh, one of the defense contractor companies? And honestly, not all of the defense contracting companies have done a great job of keeping paperwork or being supportive of helping these Afghans who are eligible for a special immigrant visa to complete their paperwork and to like find like, hey, I need my employment record from 2013, like, and I need, you know, this letter to be completed. Um, and those are the areas of failure that were built into the program that are not the fault of the visa applicant. Um, and that, you know, if we could fix those, more people could finish their visas. Let me ask you this. So let's just say someone in Afghanistan, they apply for special immigration visa. Is a I'm trying to figure out why would the Taliban be supportive of this? Is the Taliban, like the Taliban let people leave the country? Like, how does that work? I don't think if I'm, if the Taliban is like, okay, these 10 Afghans trying to accept immigration visas, that's the indicator they were fight with the Americans. So let's go torture them and kill them, right? Right. So how does that play out? Um, so the Taliban are letting people leave. And I, I recognize that I'm answering this as, as someone who's um, hearing this information secondhand from people that actually are leaving. So, um, and it's an ever evolving situation. So folks that are actually trying to depart would have like a more like up to the minute sense of like how things are, you know, in trying to get out. Um, but a lot of times uh, people leave by going to um, a third country, taking a travel visa to another country, you know, maybe saying they're going to attend a wedding or something. And then um, while there, you know, Islamabad, Pakistan is an example, finishing their visa steps with the American consulate there and then you know, moving onward to the U.S. So when people leave, like, are they leaving by themselves? Are you trying to bring the whole family? Because I would think, like, like with North Korea, if someone leaves North Korea, they sound like, when you hear in the news, the whole family gets, like, tortured and killed, right? Yeah. Is that a risk for people trying to leave Afghanistan? Like, they leave, and the oh, Taliban finds, oh, he left. His family must have known. Let's go do evil things to him. It is absolutely a risk, and it is a impossible decision that these families are being forced to make. So immediate family is available to accompany the visa recipient, you know, spouse. So, well, define immediate family. Yeah. If you do, yeah if you do. Um, spouse and minor children uh, under 18, and I believe unmarried female children that, um, you know, might be under 21. Um, however, you know, that doesn't account for parents. That doesn't account best for friends, best friends, siblings. Close cousins. Exactly. Um, and so knowing that, I mean, how hard would it be to uproot? That's a major life decision. It's a major life decision. And then um, there are programs that allow people to eventually bring their parents over, to bring siblings over. But those programs take years and years. And so you have these families that are making these impossible decisions. Some choose to stay for that reason. If What if you have a widowed mother that you're caring for, like you can't leave her behind. Um, so if there was a more streamlined way that our government allowed people to bring dependent extended family over, that type of thing, or to make an avenue, um, particularly in these cases where um, folks are looking at uh, torture, you know, uh, beatings, you know, like being a target of the Taliban, um, you know, granting them asylum to like bring additional family members over. Has there been a case where somebody got a special immigration visa, came to the United States, and then went back? Yes, there and, are. And, were, I, and then were able to leave again and come back to the United States? Because I would think they went back like, like if someone will say, like, if he's going to say, I'm going back to Afghanistan, I'm like, dude, what are you doing, right? Right. I, I have heard of people going back, um, and um, there's probably more specifics out there, but like, you know, people have gone back like 
to say to get married or a child, you know, an adult child has gone back to get married. You know, maybe they were betrothed before their family, you know, left, you know, they came over here and now they're, you know, in their early twenties and they're going to go back, you know, marry and then bring their spouse back over. Um, so there are those cases. Yeah, they're big ass risks. I mean, you think you have to like, you have to like right. sneak across the border of Pakistan or something, right? I mean, like. Right. You know, like move. You, you probably don't like want move. to fly into the fucking the airport. Right. And we, and we, um, you know, when we're doing our work with No One Left Behind, we try to be really sensitive to the community that we're helping that, you know, like, all right, well, you know, they, they don't want these stories on social media, you know, or names being used or faces being shown in certain cases because, you know, it just presents like even more risk to the family that has remained behind. So what, for you know, like when, when this all happened, when like, you know, we left Afghanistan and the thing of like, we're leaving the, the, the like, you know, female education is a big thing. Like, has like, I know the Taliban were like, oh no, we're not be as bad. But from your point of view, has like, how, how what's happened? Like, has like Taliban reverted like the old Taliban, like, like the, what's it called, Shari law back to the 1500s? Has that really happened or has it been like more modernized, so to speak? That My is understanding is that there is a an attempt to return to Sharia law um, and that rights, particularly those afforded to women and girls, have been drastically walked back from what they were, you know, the previous 20 years. Um, is with opportunities like advanced education or even just higher education beyond um, elementary school, uh, opportunities to work outside the home, um, opportunity, you know, like cannot even travel without uh, a male chaperone, that type of thing, which makes it difficult sometimes where you have households where, you know, that maybe are led by a woman, you know, she's widowed, you know, or, um, you know, she hadn't yet married or had kids, you know, and is leaving because she's a special immigrant visa recipient or another, you know, just trying to get to Pakistan uh, without a male relative um, or a male chaperone uh, presents a lot of danger and difficulty, you know, like, and I think there's systems where you like they have people who are acting as chaperones and escorts, you know, to prevent uh, detection and being detained by the Taliban. So it, Afghanistan is considered a third world country, right? I, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Do you happen to know like how the economy is doing right now? Is it, like getting better, getting worse, stagnated? And and again, just hearing this secondhand from the from the Afghans and the Afghan Americans that I am friends with, that the economy has you know greatly slowed down since the the withdrawal of the the U.S. and the international presence and the return of the Taliban. Um, looking at things like free trade, um, you know, a thriving economy where anyone can work, where you have a lot of opportunity. Like what's people's incentive to what's the incentive for international businesses to invest in Afghanistan right now um, if they're worried about, you know, uh, an autocratic regime, you know, and, and the security risks and everything. Um, so that, you know, would cause um, a slowdown in the economy. And also, um, I believe, like, the Taliban are realizing that governance is difficult. <laughs> um, like, yeah, yeah. Operating, you know, a, an entire country, you know, that's the, a, a large country that is spread out over a big geographic area with a lot of variety and you know tribes, right? and, yeah tribes. um that is difficult to govern um and to like serve a population you know with things like healthcare you know like access to enough food like you know infrastructure updates those types you know policing um that's a challenge in any country um and frankly like they are not career bureaucrats or like you know, folks like involved in government, like they're inexperienced at it. And I think they're realizing that it's difficult. And a plus the fact that a landlock doesn't help either, I'm, I'm thinking. Right. Yeah. There's not like a lot of rail lines coming into the country, you know, no ports, obviously. So does Afghanistan actually have any allies? The Taliban do have any allies? I, I know like during the peace talks, they were dealing with the people with the country of Qatar, I think maybe Pakistan, but it's not like the prime, like the prime minister of Mexico is flying in every day and having dinner or conversations right i don't think so i mean i might speculate that perhaps some of the u.s the countries that the u.s also considers adversaries might be making investments yeah, in in afghanistan such as you know china looking at mining rights there continuing to like think 100 years out you know as far as like the natural resources of the country um and continuing to make those investments where most countries have not been willing to so that's a good point like i, I definitely agree should have pulled out but like People don't know Afghanistan has like a boatload of resources, right? I was surprised that we didn't like keep something there, right? Like, a, a, like I want like a division, a military base, some kind of presence, right? A U.S. embassy because they have so much stuff, right? I believe it was short-sighted on our part. Yeah, is my my personal opinion. Here's one for you: 
this is a kind of pet peeve of mine. Like American citizens, not to talk politics, but I will. We're so far sighted, right? Like the poly, the, the preservation are actually going all right. Not once has anyone bought up like the withdrawal from Afghanistan, right? I think that's just a shame, right? Like if, if I'm like the Republican side, I'm bringing that up. Like, you know, here's President Biden's leadership in this part, right? But maybe it's like so long ago, they know no one cares about it. I, I think it briefly came up in one in the first presidential debate, um, what, just two, three weeks ago um, with uh, former President Trump being like, hey, this was a complete embarrassment, you know, for the U.S. But you're right. As, as far as um, like if the, you had like if you did like 10 issues, you'd probably make the top 10. Exactly. And looking at like, all right, what did we learn? What did we do wrong there? Like, what could we continue to fix? Like, I frankly think um you know, a lot of people just like to see the issue just like go away. And also there are, you know, the the national attention span is short yeah. um, and there have been other issues like the war in Ukraine, the Israel Gaza war that is, you know, diverting, um, understandably, attention from, you know, a crisis that is ongoing but happened in 21 when these are more recent. And that's just kind of how our 24 hour news cycle brain runs now. So how does no one left behind? Like, y'all, you're doing all the best to put this back in the forefront of American public policy, so to speak. Right. Yep. And we do that through three pillars. Um, so No One Left Behind, which has been around since 2013. We we grew during the withdrawal, but we've been around um, for much longer. Um, remains very involved in advocating um, for the special immigrant visa program, ways to improve the program, and the situation of Afghans and Iraqis um, that are still waiting to to come here and for their visas to be finished. Uh, we're involved with evacuation, so we're helping people depart Afghanistan, um, and then we're involved in resettlement once they're here. Um, so, and in doing all of our outreach and discussion and presence on those three pillars, and framing it as like we feel that this is a moral obligation that the United States has to honor the promise that we we made when we went into Afghanistan and Iraq, and asked partners to to help us in this effort, you know, at great risk to themselves. Um, and it's now our turn to keep up that end of the bargain. So what do y'all do for resettlement? Like you help them find a house, help them find a job, talk about the process of resettlement. Yeah. Um, so we work in conjunction with the resettlement agencies in the United States, and there's several major resettlement agencies in the U.S. that do receive government funding to help immigrants from all, you know, countries across the world resettle in the U.S., and so in partnership with them, um, we look at uh, what are people experiencing when they first come here? They need access to affordable, safe housing. Um, they need access to reliable transportation because most U.S. cities are not uh, walkable or public transportation free, particularly with affordable housing also in the conjunction with, you know, in the same mix as that. Um, and then they need assistance in restarting their careers. Um, so. Those three things we look at, you know, like what are people, um, what do people need most um, when they restart their lives here? And so those first six months are really formative, you know, of people um, restarting their income, you know, to the level where they're able because uh, resettlement housing money will run out within three months. Um, the government provides three months of housing stipend. Um, so people need to be earning enough um, after those three months to afford their housing. Um, it's hard to find a job here in three months. It is really hard to find a job here in three months. And, you know, we find that people go through um, a progression, you know, as they restart their careers. A lot of times uh, gig economy jobs like Uber or DoorDash, like if you have uh, access to reliable transportation is a way to immediately start generating some income. And then, you know, a lot of jobs like unarmed security is another um, fairly quick uh, way to become employed as people work through, you know, recertifications, U.S.-based certifications to restart their careers. Um, we have a no-interest loan program that um, helps people, you know, as they're doing things like needing to recertify um, because, you know, someone may have a IT or technical background, um, or I was talking to someone who was an electrical engineer last, last night, um, but recertifying for that in the U.S. is a lengthy process. And there are programs like where someone can, you know, get a Microsoft certification, but they also need to support their family while they're going through this intense, like, certification and, and you know, education program. And so our loans can help with that while they're, you know, looking at upskilling. 
that's a good point. Like, I don't know how you fix this, right? Let's suppose someone will say someone comes from uh, Colombia, right? Yeah. And they're like, we'll say they're a certified plumber in Colombia. They come here, it's like, we just ignore all these other credentials, right? And maybe, right. maybe it's because like, our stuff's higher, more quality. I don't I have no idea, right? You know, I mean, me personally, I don't know if I want a doctor from, you know, a third world country doing heart surgery on me, you know, I don't, I don't know about that. ability based. Like we have a U.S. credentialing system okay. and like, you but know. A, I guess besides them redoing everything over again, I can't imagine like being like a engineer, or a, a plumber going through eight years apprenticeship and have to do the whole thing over again. Right. And then. Right. Yeah. Struggle. But is this the way it is or any way you think we stream like that or. Um, so, so I hosted a family, um, who spent, uh, 15 months with me in, in Stephen city, Virginia. And in this case, the woman was the special immigrant visa recipient. Um, and she had medically trained as a doctor, as a, as a young woman, you know, in college and then after college, um, before becoming involved, um, in UN and USAID programs. Um, so her in coming here to the U S I mean, like, and and not only had, you know, her education had been in Afghanistan and where all her, you know, uh, residency and everything was done, but she also hadn't been in the medical field for about 12 years. Um, so restarting her career, um, she took, you know, initially some like online based courses through like the community college system just for like lab assistant, like, you know, phlebotomy type courses. Um, that's to take a lot of uh, humbling yourself and getting rid of your ego, right? It's got to be disappointing because it's like, I've already done this. Like I am capable of this. Like I do this. And then and how, to like have to start she, over. How long was she a doc doctor for? Um, she she went through medical school and then she did about six to nine months of her residency before going to work, you know, for the international government. Uh, Can you imagine like then you work for some random person who has no yeah. your experience? So I'm really proud of her. She has an awesome job now. She is uh working for the Dallas um health department um in healthcare again but she is going to look at like recertifying at all stages um you know to get back to um a level that you know that she wants to be at which is commensurate with her um her previous education and and her ability so what is a special immigrant visa okay a special immigrant visa was a program that was created during the war on terror specifically for partners in afghanistan and iraq and I mention that because that's something we hope to see change and we hope to see this become a global program for anywhere that the U.S. works with allies in a combat zone. Um, but if a person worked um, to assist the U.S., the U.S. or the international forces spent one year working uh, in that position, passed a security check, everything, then our commitment to them was they are eligible for this special immigrant visa. And that allows them to come to the to the United States to bring their immediate family. Um, and it's a it's a green card program. So once they're here, they they get their green card. So it leads to um, legal permanent residency or citizenship. So it's a path to U.S. citizenship. So is this a challenge? I don't, I'm going to be making this up. I suppose you're bringing like, a, we'll say like 10 Afghan families, right? Do they usually get put in like with low income housing people? It depends on the city. Okay. Um, and it depends on like what's available in the city. Like I know, like, um, and there's, there's areas, uh, there's certain areas and cities in the country where, because there's a large Afghan American population, like recently arriving Afghans want to go to where, yeah. you know, they're, they may already have, you know, friends and family, um, or they would feel comfortable. Um, so in those cities, I mean, like, uh, Sacramento, California is one, um, Seattle is another one, uh, Dallas, Texas, you know, Northern Virginia, um, I mean, there's there is a lack of affordable housing in the United States. There is an affordable housing crisis for everyone, not just new immigrant arrivals. Um, so it's it's a mixed bag depending on what resettlement agencies in different cities have access to. Being part, um, so I live uh, in Stephen City, Virginia, which is about an hour and twenty minutes west of Washington D.C. It's the closest major city is Winchester, Virginia, and um, there's like very little actual subsidized housing there. Um, so they are really just kind of reaching into the community because it's a smaller city. And so my my home is a duplex. So I had an available uh, vacant unit um, that I just volunteered to to host the family in at no cost um, for their time there. But they're reaching out to to landlords, you know, like, hey, where, where are the pockets of uh, affordable uh, housing in, in these different cities and what's available? I mean, there might be long waiting lists for 
So is this a challenge? Like, suppose you put a, a family in with like low income housing. Do those people who have been there like, like maybe five, 10 years, they like the channel, like, hey, the resources are short already. Why are you bringing these immigrants in here? America first. Like, we've been poor for like, that's a bad term to use, but we've been struggling for all these years. No one gives resources, and all of a sudden, these people come from out of nowhere. Yeah. Like, you know, I would be interested to talk to a family that had um, gone into a housing situation like that, where maybe they're like looking at, you know, kind of, all these different cultures coming together, you know, of, hey, what is what's what was your experience as like a newly arrived family? Like, were you encountering um, either bias or resentment from, you know, other people who have, you know, maybe like you said, been in the system longer um, or feel that these resources are scarce? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a challenge that. Have you heard that? any complaints or any stories secondhand or anything? I, me personally, I have okay. not. I bet. Uh, I bet if I ask within our Afghan American community, like they, they probably heard. You know, their, people have probably been more candid with them about like, hey, this is how like it felt my first month when I was trying to get to know like my neighbors and acclimate, you know, to a new culture. And so you, you said the the biggest Afghan communities are in Sacramento, Seattle, and where else? Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth area, uh, and Northern Virginia. So why those areas? Like, does the, someone just pick those areas? The Afghan people said this is the closest to our weather. I think for for years and years, like there's already been an Afghan American population here. And so like it just, you know, it continues to to build on itself, just like there's, you know, still a big like Irish and Italian population yeah. in like New York yeah. and like that type of thing. Um, you know, it's people are going to where, you know, they've heard about like um some of my favorite conversations that I've had are with families as they choose like where to come in the US. And I mean like you, know, you grow up looking at a map of a country that isn't yours and like yeah. it's an abstract, you know, yeah. so it's like uh, I remember one family saying to me like, all right, we're flying through to Chicago to get to uh, Sacramento. Like, where is Chicago? And then like walking him through like, OK, this is Chicago and you're going to right? like it's not like in line with where you're going. It's not close. Um, and just looking at this, the size of the U.S., the variety, um, you know, it's it's neat to see it through through newcomers eyes. So for the next year. But no, no one left behind. What's success for y'all? Like, what's what's determines if you're successful next year? Great question. All right. So for in the next for 2024, we set a goal for ourselves. We want to help 7,000 people leave Afghanistan, um, and we're about halfway there. Um, mainly, we help people get out through Pakistan. Um, we help them with housing uh, while they wait in Pakistan and finish their processing through um, the U.S. consulate in Islamabad. Um, and then we want to help another three, 3,000 people with resettlement here in the U S you have like a liaison in Pakistan. Oh, uh, we do. We have, you know, like other partners that we've been working with, you know, like we, we work in conjunction with the state department. So, um, as people are getting ready to fly to the U S like we're in constant communication, like, Hey, this, you know, this visa, this family, you know, is here, like they're ready for their medical exam. Like, um, a lot of times, you know, it'll be a flight that is, um, paid for by the U.S. government, you know, if someone's visa and their family's finished, like the government pays for them to make the final onward movement to the U.S. What if someone says, hey, I want to I want to do this. I want to do this process. But my family is in France. You have to yeah. get there, too. Yeah, we've helped all kinds of like people from all over. As long as it is a country where the U.S. has an embassy and has a um, relationship where we can assist with those types like there. There are a lot of Afghan families in Iran. And we're just not able to help them yeah, unless they move somewhere yeah. else, you know, and then we can like send some assistance. Um, but yeah, fa the family that I hosted, they got out through Iceland and uh, the the woman uh, had professional connections uh, from some training that she had done with uh, the UN in Iceland a few years prior. And so they were able to get a tourist visa to Iceland. And then once there started working with the US consulate and us to and Iceland put them in government housing. Uh, for the four months that they were there and um, finished their visa processing there and then and then came over. What's been some of the like, frustrating things about doing all this? Is there government bureaucracy or something else? Uh, government bureaucracy is a never ending frustration, <laughs> like just across all aspects of it, not just um, not just this, but that has been a very big one. Um, seeing uh, the attention be diluted by other issues. And while we realize that there are, you know, many crises going across the globe that are like very deserving of attention and assistance in itself, trying to keep people focused on like, 
hey, thousands of our allies are still in a very difficult situation and like still need our help. Like we committed this to them. Um, that's been frustrating as well. And that's, you know, what we're constantly working towards. Um, and then we're also constantly working, uh, you know, with our government partners to like, hey, what are ways that we can improve this program and make it just a little bit faster and a little bit more streamlined, available? We, we would love to see it become a permanent program. Right now it is reauthorized um, continuously um, and it is only available for Afghanistan and Iraq. And we want it to see, to see it become a global permanent program. Immigration, that's a federal purview, right? Yeah. So it's not like Colorado say, okay, they're only letting like 100 whatever in. We're going to increase the 10,000. This was the state of Colorado, Colorado, right? Right. Yeah, it's, okay. it's a federal federal program. And let's suppose it's like, we'll say 10,000 people. Is that, is that, that divided equally to the states or is it like 10,000 period? It, um, it fluctuates to, based on uh, what states and what cities have capacity and what resettlement agencies have capacity. So if it's 10,000 that are coming and that are authorized, like, uh, you know, there may be times when Sacramento has capacity, but after the forest fires last year and after, you know, like, um, you know, a, a certain, you know, like a big wave comes like they're at capacity and it's like, you know, the government is not sending newly arrived folks to Sacramento. And I'm using this as an example. Um, then they're, they're looking for, all right, what resettlement agencies, what areas of the country have capacity? And that's another thing that we always advocate for. That's another reason we're up here in Seattle this week is because we're looking at a program uh, with the Welcome Corps, which is a public-private partnership um, that looks at how we can increase capacity in places like Seattle um, to help more families uh, arrive here. And the program that we're looking at is where um, private sponsor groups can take on some of the assistance of newly, you know, helping newly arrived families navigate things like healthcare, getting children enrolled in schools, you know, finding access to transportation, you know, those types of things, you know, getting your um, uh, EBT started, those, those types of things. Um, and, and if we can increase capacity in certain cities, that may speed up the rate at which people can come here. So let's say obviously a translator is already know how to speak English, right? Mm -hmm. But let's suppose a wife and three kids don't speak English. Do y'all teach them English or how does that work? We personally don't teach them English, but you have identified like a very real challenge that a lot of new families face where the spouse that wasn't the translator may not have the English language ability that the spouse who did work for the government had. And that can lead to like feelings of isolation or, um, you know, they, they're cut off from, you know, a community that they had back home and family, and they're thrust into an environment where it's more difficult to assimilate into a new culture if you don't speak the language. Um, and that's where our Afghan ambassadors are so important in communities because they understand access to programs like in their cities, like, hey, you need an English as a second language program. Like, here's one that um, where a newly arrived, you know, Afghan spouse will feel comfortable going you know, that type of thing. Um, or you can get to it if you don't have a car yet, that type of thing. We find that um, children, particularly the younger they are, um, really, you know, children are so resilient, you know, start to thrive, you know, immediately, you know, going to school and, you know, just, be, just being kids. Yeah, definitely. Um, so most people in Afghanistan have follow the Islamic religion, correct? And so does that, like, I'm guessing you're not going to put them in a, in a place that's like zero percent of that religion, right? Does that play a role where you place them at, like percent of the people in that population with that religion they follow? So I think it it may be something that the resettlement agencies consider, um, but not so much where it's like, oh, we're you know, there's not a big presence of that religion in this area. It's more of like, hey, let's help you find access to a mosque or a place of worship where you feel comfortable, you know. Um, and it, he, here's where it's located, you know, let's help with an introduction, you know, to the imam or to the to the leadership, you know, because if, if you have trouble getting there in your first few weeks when you don't have a car, like those types of things. So it's helping people uh, find comfort, you know, in communities that way versus like, uh, you know, all right, there's only 2% practicing, you know, Muslims in this city. We're not going to send people there. It's more like, all right, how can you, you know, help, um, you know, folks feel comfortable and get settled in their new community. I'm guessing there's a choice between like selling someone to Seattle, Washington with all the resources here and like, we'll say Smallville, Arkansas with no resources. Seattle wins that every time. Uh, 
what a surprise. So like some states, like, like there's, um, programs in Arkansas where like communities have taken on, um, you know, a certain number of families and like, just to have, like, they understand what their capacity is as far as like housing and ability to absorb new families and have done tremendous things. So it's really community dependent, of course, like larger cities that are more of a melting pot, like are going to have, um, a lot bigger capacity and, um, systems in place and, and, uh, nonprofits and organizations, church organizations that are already developed in helping um, a, a very diverse population. So how do you help people when they come here, like deal with like the high rates of crime and all those stuff we have come here that they might not have in Afghanistan, right? Right. Yeah. Like uh, I, that's um, and again, that's where our, we, th we think our ambassadors are such strong and important, like the central um, nucleus of how our organization functions. Uh, and when I say ambassador, what I'm talking about is um, an Afghan or Iraqi American that has been here, you know, from anywhere from a few years to a decade um, that understands the community and, you know, understands what re has had their own experience um, restarting their life and career here um, that that is a main community organizer. Um, so leaning on them for like, all right, it's and Ahmad and I were talking about this in the car on the way over. You know, it is a cultural adjustment. Um coming to a new country, you know, like, what is it like here? You know, what are the things that you're going to encounter that are completely different? And those are just conversations and experiences that happen in the, in the first months. Are you able to do this? This might actually be illegal or unethical. Like you set a family, everything was great. Are you able to have like go on social media and tell the story? Only with their permission, okay. only with their very do a lot of, explicit Do a lot permission. of people do that or they're kind of shy? Like they don't want to be like, and then you said you, you don't put them out there because of the Taliban and stuff too. Yeah, a lot of people are reserved because they're concerned about the safety of their families that remain in Afghanistan, their extended families. Um, and so while we are always looking for stories to tell, because that's how people connect to, um, you know, these different experiences. Especially like that's, for the fundraising, I would think. It helps with fundraising. It helps people understand like, hey, this is why it's still important. Like, this is what people are still going through like right now. Um, we only do it if, you know, people are like, yes, you can share my story. You you can share my pictures, but blur my face or use like a, a an alias, that type of thing. Um, or we generalize a story, that type of thing. Do you ever have that go like testify in front of like a comedian Congress, anything like immigration comedian? I personally that. haven't, but our uh, chief advocacy officer, Andy Sullivan, has, and he did a wonderful job. I mean, how about the actual immigrant families? Oh, um, not from No One Left Behind, okay. um, but I think um, there have been uh, either Afghans from the Afghan National Army um, or different um, organizations that have testified. Right, so next, I'm going to give you my phone, and I want you to go over these things right here if you can. Yeah. Boy, you're sorry. Oh, you want to talk about, okay, the, the yeah, those, amendments? Those, those four things, yeah. Okay. That's, that's just recent, right? It is. Okay. Did you like to do a deep dive for each one of those? Can I, can I yeah, do this yeah, real quick yeah. and, and look at it? Sorry, I don't have reading glasses on. And, and what I'm looking at right now is amendments that um, have either been added or failed to be added to this year's defense bill um, that would help our allies. So this is taking a look at this. Um, okay, so in going through these, um, the first one talks about the authorization of additional visas and why this is so important is because we see the number fluctuate every year. And truthfully, it can fluctuate with political environment. Um, we worry about the number um, decreasing or being cut off. For example, um, in Iraq, the number has been incredibly limited um, and we want to see that changed. Um, the second amendment um, talks about um, making reforms to the Afghan SIV program. And why that is important is those are the complex steps that I talked about. And so we're, we're because that is existing legislation, like, hey, this is how the program operates, in order to modify and improve the program, it requires a change in legislation. Um, and so it's making these inter incremental changes like, hey, you know, we used to say, all right, it requires a general officer letter. Um, well, maybe it just should require like uh, a Department of Defense person, you know, who was in a position of responsibility to do a letter, like <laughs> trying to track down these generals from like 2007. Like that's that's difficult. Like, are they even still alive? <laughs> and not all of them. I like, so. um, all right. The next one is looking at, OK, expanding humanitarian status for certain Afghans. 
um, particularly if they will submit to additional vetting and in-person interviews as they apply for legal permanent legal status. Um, so there's the special immigrant visa program that we talk about, but then there's also humanitarian parole, which a lot of Afghans were brought to the U.S. during the withdrawal on humanitarian parole. And their parole time period has been extended, but they may not have been granted um, permanent legal status. And that's what this is talking about is, all right, how do we make a decision and speed that up? And right now there's frustration because just like decisions are not being made at the U.S. government. But if, you know, we allow like Afghans that are willing to do some of this in per, you know, like, and I, I'm sure many, many, if not all would agree to this, things like in-person inter interviews, additional vetting to speed up the approval of their humanitarian parole. And then the final one, okay, it's it's looking at resourcing the State Department with an additional position um, to, to facilitate this program execution. And so resourcing the State Department, like that's another important step, I think because limited resources are available within government agencies to execute this program. So any additional resources, whether it's personnel, money, um, you know, that type of thing will facilitate like easing some of the bottleneck. Um, so this is, you took this from our website, right? Okay, so if you go to our website, noonleft.org, and you look on the advocacy page, those things that I just gave a very top level overview of, um, there's very specific steps there where if you wanna talk to your legislator um, in your district about this to see if they support it or to see if um, they didn't support it in the most recent defense bill, those are things that individual citizens can do um, as they interact with their elected officials. Um, hey, you know, I saw that you did not support this amendment that provides additional visas, or I saw that you did, like, thank you, that's important, that type of thing. And that's um, something that individual citizens can do that doesn't involve contributing money or that type of thing. Thanks for bringing that up. So how much lobbying do y'all do in Congress or the Senate or DC period? Uh, we have a team uh, dedicated to advocating. Um, That's the better word. Don't lobby. Lobby seems so, <laughs> so used. Right, right. Uh, nonprofits advocate for uh, for marginalized groups and for improvements to programs. Um, so we have, uh, like I said, our chief advocacy officer and our director of advocacy, um, both who have Hill backgrounds, um, who uh, Andy Sullivan, our chief, is a veteran. Sonia herself has worked on the Hill for years. Um, are very involved with understanding like what individual offices are interested in supporting, uh, what's within the realm of possible with different committees. It was like I said, it was Andy who testified before HVAC um, on these specific things. So I'm guessing with the to resources, you're going to focus on advocating like someone, a Congress who's on immigration committee versus a Congress who might be on the, I don't know, the beekeeping committee, right? That sounds like a great committee. I'd like to be on that one. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, you're you're looking at impact. Like it's like it's a um it's a strategy of like, all right, where are areas where the most impact can be made? You're right. Someone who's on a committee like state and foreign ops or um, you know, the um the armed services committee. Um, but every member of Congress, you know, has a district, you know, has the capacity within their district and connections to local resettlement agencies to, you know, like at the local level, like personally facilitate, not personally, at the local level facilitate, you know, um, the resettlement experience that newly arrived Afghans are having. So that's where that's important. Um, and also awareness and education of like, hey, here's what we're looking for Congress to vote on this year. This is why we think it matters and the impact it's making in your area. You know, you, you have, you know, and they're, they, they know their districts, you know, so like, you have a district where, you know, there's a large population. You all spend any time like advocating like individual cities, like maybe advocate Seattle. Hey, Seattle, you done a lot so far, but can you find your heart like bringing like more resettlement people, more resources here? We will always talk to state and local government partners, you know, elected officials, you know, like city councilmen, um, organizations like resettlement agencies that are regional. Um, so, yes, we always work through our partners to be like, hey, what are ways that we can team up uh, or facilitate additional capacity? So I remember back when this, uh, we just left back in Afghanistan, and there's a small minority of people, I thought X or Twitter, what do you want? They were talking about not to let anyone over, but you want to take a test, even one terrorist coming over here, when one person who like a born bad actor, right? Right. What's your 
you like your counterpoint, like to say that this would never happen or the chance of so slim or whatever. Like yeah. That. Well, the people who are eligible for the special immigrant visa have also already gone through very intense background screening just to work alongside the U.S. government. So not only did they go through screening to become an employee back in the day when they were working with U.S. forces, but they are also going through, you know, intense screening um, to get their visa finalized. Um, and so we look at this. I mean, this is a nonpartisan issue. It is merit based immigration. I mean, of course, there is always a risk. I mean, we got plenty of bad actors within the United States that have been, you know, citizens here, natural born citizens their whole life. Um, so there's always a risk of a bad individual. But there are a lot of screening measures, you know, put in place for this program. And how many people have y'all resettled so far? Like it's just an estimate. Oh gosh, just an estimate. Um, I would say. I mean, you have an exact number, of course. You know, ten thousand. Ten thousand. Yeah. And you have to know, like, what percent, what number of that has become U.S. citizens? Ooh. Um. Well, it can take. Uh. Gosh. Three. And you all help them become U.S. citizens. Uh. Yes. In that. Um. You know, like, hey, here's an understanding of what the process takes and stuff. And then there, there are like programs that help people like study for the test and that type of thing, like get ready to become, you know, citizens. Um. It takes anywhere from three to seven years, you know, to become a U.S. citizen. So because I would say like the bulk of folks who uh, came over, you know, there was a big bubble in 21 and 22. And then like the thousands more that we're helping get out now um, was a larger bubble than the population that was coming over, you know, several hundred at a time, you know, in previous years. The, the folks that came over in 21 and beyond were probably just now starting to see like the very earliest ones that arrived in 21, like begin the process of becoming U.S. citizens. And it may still take another year, two year, three years. Okay. So we're going to come back in a minute. I want to move on to something else. Talk about being an FBI Academy graduate. Oh, yeah. Okay. Were you still in the Army when you did that or after the Army? I was. No, I was still in the Army. So the FBI National Academy is a three-month academy that's run by the FBI and is it's um, been around since the 50s. It is designed to bring law enforcement professionals from the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, uh, state and local law enforcement agencies, um, and teach them the latest uh, in investigative techniques, in networking, um, in tools and resources that are available in relationships with federal uh, law enforcement agencies. So this three-month school, FBI National Academy, incredible school. Um, the Army, all branches of the service are able to send a handful of people every year, and they focus on people that are either military police or security forces or um, counterintelligence folks. So I attended in 2014 uh, when I was a major. I was session 256. It's important to like say your session number because um, that's how people like identify with your cohort. Um, and after I completed the FBI National Academy, I then went to um, the Criminal Investigation Division uh, the based out of Fort Bragg, the one for the Southeast that had jurisdiction over a lot of the bases in the Southeast. But then we also deployed to Afghanistan. So this academy is a mental and physical? It is, yeah. Okay. What kind of talk about some of the physical things you had to do? Yeah. Well, there's uh there's physical training like throughout the week. Um, I remember we did like CrossFit competitions. Um, there you do Hogan's Alley, you know, which is like their shooting um range. And then the biggest step is the Yellow Brick Road, which is a six mile running an obstacle course, like through the woods, you know, and it's it's kind of like for me, it was very familiar because it's a lot of like your classic army obstacle course stuff, you know, like low crawling and like jumping over stuff and climbing ropes. Um, so, yeah, there's there is a physical aspect to it as well. Now, keeping in mind, a lot of people are going to this um, at a later stage in their career. <laughs> like, like, a little bit past their prime. <laughs> then, you know, like young, brand new, like FBI agents. Uh -huh. So I was one of the younger ones in the course. Let's see, this is 2014. So I was in my mid 30s. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had chiefs of police, you know, that were in their fifties. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's about the camaraderie and the mental toughness as an aspect of physical toughness, uh, and physical readiness. Yeah. Um, it's maybe not as like central a focus as like when you're either a brand new military recruit or a, a brand new FBI recruit. So I'm, I'm guessing the army is not going to send Dutch to this place, right? So I'm guessing you're like one of the like top officers at the time. You had to compete for it. <laughs> so. Did it something you competed for or did someone put you in for it? No, I competed for it. Okay. I, uh, there's an application process. Okay. There's a board. You have to get letters of recommendation. Um, and so 
I threw my hat in the ring and was fortunate enough to be selected for that particular cohort. Nice, nice. Yeah. So nice. Let's talk about something personal, right? If you don't want to, you don't have to, right? So, okay. you, I'm, you're you're single right now. Yes. Have you always been single? Uh, I was married for a few years when I was in the army, and like you know, like many veterans know, um, marriages are tough. Yeah. Uh, within the the military framework. Here's a question for you, right? And this is for any like young female officer, any young females in, in the army, like. From my experience in the army, I did 25 years. Females army had to make a choice, right? Like to, to stay single and compete at the highest level. Like I know so many, many like majors and colonels are single, got out and didn't have a family. Now it's like they all regret it, right? Yeah. Or, you know, they got married, had a kid and got out, right? Yeah. How? What's your advice to females out there like at that point in their, in their career right there? Like they're being told they're doing great. They, they have a chance to really have a good career, maybe make pro bird colonel, or they want a family. Yeah. All this conflict and stuff, right? Like, what's yes. your advice for that? Okay. Um, whew, that's a good question. That's a, that's a, that's a lot. Okay. Because I am proud to see that the military has made improvements just in, in my experience or er, in my time that I was in, you know, from, I was in from 2000 to 2020, they made changes to maternity leave. They implemented paternity leave. They improved programs for new mothers. Um, because I think in earlier years, it was almost impossible. And if I want to remember correctly, it may have been in the 70s and 80s when they first uh, brought, you know, really like integrated women into a lot of aspects of the military. It's like if you got pregnant, like you had to leave the military. That may have been like really early on, like in the 60s and 70s. Um, but it was very difficult for women to make that choice of like, how am I going to time having a family with things like, um, you know, timing command, like that type of stuff. Um, it's gotten a little better. And like, I feel like, you know, people are always like, oh, women can have it all. Like, you're still going to make choices and trade offs. Like, there are, I have many friends who have very successfully, you know, women, um, had children, raised children, and still had incredible careers, like been commanders, you know, reached um, very high levels in their career. But with a family, you are always going to make trade-offs, as you should. <laughs> um, you know, like, hey, this is not the right time to take this assignment because, you know, I have a child who's having a health issue or, you know, we decided to have our second baby right now. Me personally, I made the decision not to have children. That's one that I am good with. Um, you know, other people may have had you know urge later on in your life that, what's it, what's it called, the biological? The biological urge didn't, didn't kick in for me. Like, uh, and I, you know... I think women, thankfully, um, now, you know, nowadays um, have the ability to decide that and to, you know, take measures to to control that that previous generations didn't. So it's an option, um, you know, that we have like I can actively plan to choose or if, you know, to choose to have a family or not. Um, and that's not something that previous generations, you know, had access to that like level of control and planning. Um, so for me, you know, the never. Never really felt the urge. Love kids, um, you know. But you love everyone else's kids. Right. Exactly. Like, come visit you're the probably, farm and then you probably the go best, home. You're probably the best in the history of the world. Exactly. Right. Come visit the ponies and then and then go home. <laughs> I think a lot of it has to do with your boss too, right? I have a good friend. Um, she's an army captain for Bragg. She's a therapist, right? Yeah. And so she has to she has to go to school for for therapist stuff, but then her husband's getting deployed Gaza with no return date, right? Right. And so she took him, you know. They had a problem to take her to get deployed, right? If her boss had nerve to ask her, you couldn't find no one else to take your husband? Yeah. I'm like, did he really say that? Right. Of course, he's like, better officer, or not really army, you know, like, no right. no army officer is going to say that shit to you, right? So, yeah, just don't say it. Don't, I mean, let it bother them. But still, like, man, like, you kidding me, right? Yeah. But that stuff's still out there, unfortunately. It is. And um, the military lifestyle is not easy on spouses that are not in the military who are trying to maintain their own career, you know, because you are looking at moving every couple of years and it's hard to establish a career where like uh, either you're going to move or your spouse is going to deploy. And then it's like, well, now I'm the primary uh, child care provider where maybe before we had like a balance of, you know, yeah. with like daycare and like, you know, just had two parents to like manage this type of thing. Um, so it is very difficult for the non-military spouse. And that's the decision that, you know, a lot of military families like face is like, how can I help my spouse have a thriving career um, if that's what they want that's meaningful to them while still like, uh, you know, doing the necessary elements of my own career that they may not have a lot of choice and control over? 
Yeah, this is a fact I wish more people knew, but like military spouses, they have the highest unemployment rate of any demographic and the highest underemployment rate of any demographic. Yes, because you have so many, you know, educated um, uh, spouses that you're right, that just either they, they may not be in an, you know, we have bases in a lot of like remote or rural areas, like the job market um, in Fayetteville near Fort Liberty, you know, <laughs> North Carolina, like might not be what like a, you know, um, you know, a spouse who has a background, you know, in like immigration law or something. Now, thankfully, I think COVID changed the work environment. And so there are more remote work opportunities and both our government and nonprofits have done a lot of work in helping, you know, keep spouse, military spouses, find employment and employment at an appropriate level. Um, but it is, it's still a big challenge and it's a challenge that a lot of military families face. Yeah. So next, let's move on to your, like, well, quote unquote, the job that pays you money. Is it called, is it called Acrete AI? Acrete. Acrete yep. AI. Acrete AI. How long, how long have you been with them? So I've been with Acrete for three years and I'm glad you asked me because it is a great company and I've had such a good experience there that um, I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, I was supposed to start at Acrete on September 1st of 21 and uh, at in mid to late August of 21, no one left behind and a number of us on the board and, and, and volunteers were so, and as well as like thousands of veterans and other folks across the country were so involved in the evacuation and it was 24 hour operations, you know, being contacted by thousands of people. I mean, like the utter absorption that all of us that were involved in the evacuation, evacuation, like it took over our lives in mid 21 that I reached out to my future boss in Crete and was like, I'm really sorry. I'm not going to be able to start this job. And he was like, what are you talking about? Like, and so I, I, you know, I, I, I knew him and I'd interviewed with him. So I told him about what I was doing. Um, and he came to visit us at our uh, coordination cell and, you know, he knew some of the other folks there cause we had a lot of former military and current military and he's retired military himself. Um, and then was like, that's all right. Like take the time you need, um, finish this up. This is yeah, you you know, like on that one. incredible work. And then just start later in September when, like when you're free and, um, they have been really supportive, um, my entire time with the company, as well as they have also supported, um, the defense intelligence Memorial foundation, which is the, um, foundation that was stood up, uh, by the DIA after Shannon Kent was killed in Syria. Um, so they've really, uh, you know, look at the, the aspect of the whole person and their employees and like, right, what do people care about? What are they involved in? Like, how can we help? So what do you do for them? I'm the director of operations uh, for the office of the CEO. Uh, so Accrete has- Chief of staff sort of like, or chief operations? I work with the chief, chief of staff. It's, okay. it's the operations cell with the chief of okay. staff. Um, so we've got four offices. We have an office in Manhattan. We have a team in India. Uh, we have a research team uh, up in Massachusetts near MIT. And then we have our federal office in Northern Virginia. Yes, so y'all do, do like a, a lot of government contracts? Uh, so we we have some government contracts. We are a prime contractor. Um, we sell. We have a um, a multi year contract with the Department of Defense that looks at our supply chain tool called Argus Supply Chain, and it specifically looks at concealed foreign influence on entities and companies that the government may be purchasing from or partnering with. Um, the DoD can do due diligence on like, hey, this appears to be like a Canadian technology company, you know, let me look and see, is there adversarial foreign ownership? Like buy stuff? Uh, like, is there Chinese government ownership okay. of, you know, a company that appears to be Canadian? That okay. type of thing. Okay. And on their website, it says, uh, our vision is an end to Nada's loss. What does that mean? Yeah. So um, nowadays with this immense data collection, I mean, there there is too much available information and there is too much information and data available to manage. Um, so the knowledge agents that we build um, are always looking at ways that like companies aren't losing, uh, aren't, you know, aren't having knowledge loss. So, you know, if a person leaves a company, they've been there for five or six years, they've touched multiple different data systems, you know, different operating systems, as well as just their, you know, intrinsic knowledge of the business and like everything that's passed through their email for the past several years. Um, how do you capture and replicate that in a form that the company can continue to like utilize? Like, Hey, you know, we worked on this five years ago. Like, 
let me query, you know, like what's everything that we did previously on this? So that's the type of knowledge loss that we're talking about. So why, why do you use AI for this? Does AI make this a less complicated problem to solve? Like why add AI on AI to the top of this problem solving thing? Be, because the amount of data out there now is, is, not able to be processed by a human in a in a, like a reasonable time frame. Um, you know, it could take months. It could take years to go through millions of financial documents. Um, so you need a tool. You need some type of artificial intelligence tool to to help the the human go through that and understand it. So people would be scared, or so they should be like, you know, optimistic that AI is coming on board, so to speak. Yeah, I. I personally am optimistic. I think people should be optimistic at um, at how this is going to help us, you know, prevent knowledge loss and to um, manage and understand, you know, our environment better. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good thing. I think it's going to fundamentally change um, the work environment, careers, like how people study and research. Uh, but yeah, do you think there's a job out there that AI may not potentially take over? I hope it never takes over for artists and writers and like true human creativity. Um, things where people care is really important, like, you know, firsthand, like medical providers, um, where the human aspect uh, and the human connection is really important. Here's one for you. I've asked this before on the podcast. Let's suppose you're, you have an open heart surgery, right? Yeah. You want a doctor, human doctor or AI to do it? I would want both. Um because I think that would be an incredible team, like uh, a human surgeon who's been doing it for 30 years uh, may have an intuitive sense of like recognizing, you know, anomalies or just, you know, things that um, an AI tool might not. But I might actually want the like precision. <laughs> the precision of, you know, the, yeah. um, the, the robotic surgeon, you know, and like as well as, you know, like monitoring you know all my vitals like all that type of thing yeah, the um, first person asking answer like that most people say human i was follow up the question okay this for the human doctor put this last in this class and has like two or three more practice suits right. oh hey hi, hey, hi. <laughs> i think the team and i, I think I, and i think you're going to see a lot more yeah. of that like kind of that teaming like it should be a tool to enhance our human talent and our human gifts um not a replacement um but rather like it's enhancing our own abilities what do you see as a future of AI? Oh gosh, um, that's a big question. Uh, I believe it is going to become uh, infused in all aspects of our life, just the way that um, the internet and cell phones are uh, ubiquitous now. Like we use the internet constantly throughout the day. Like it's a tool that, you know, like the youngest children understand like, all right, I'm going to look this up or I want to see this or like I'm going to interact, you know, with a video or something. Um, I believe that's how you're going to see like different AI tools, you know, begin to like it's just going to become uh, totally integrated into our day to day lives. So a, a create AI, they're based like a tech startup, correct? Yeah. And we're an old startup. And then you all just raised the money recently or? We did. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. And we're we're proud that. Um, we have bootstrapped the company. Um, we haven't taken large institutional money. Um, I think that's uh, you know something that we're considering in the future. Um, but it's been investments from you know friends and family, like you know, and you know the company uh, has recurring revenue now. So um, we're really proud of of how we've built it along the way. So who is like a quote unquote like your perfect customer, so to speak? Yeah. Um, so we have a tool. Uh, it's called Nebula Social. Um, and the government version is called Argus Social. Um, and we're an enterprise company. You know, we look at both um, any industry, you know, commercially uh, can use our tools as well as like we see where the government um, can use them as well. So anyone that really wants to understand like the constantly changing environment um, to be able to like process that knowledge and to figure out the best ways to shape it, to respond, um, that's our ideal customer. And that covers a lot of industries. And so when you joined the, the a Crete, like how big were they? Like what you employee number 54, 21? On the federal team, I was employee number five. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure where I was on the commercial side. I now work for the commercial side, um, but we're at about 140 employees right now. Okay. Talk about this. Like one time I tell people, I try to advise them to go for a startup, right? Yeah. It's like 
but most people they want to go work as U.S. government contractors. So talk about what you gain from working for a startup coming from the military. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a really good question because um, you're right. A lot of people they they leave the military and they go to like you know something that they're comfortable with. There's a lot of Deloitte's and you know Booz Allen's out there, great jobs, um, uh, or right back into a government job. Um, so if working in working for a startup, um, you're probably trading off security um, for a lot more um, ability to like to be involved and to like shape the the aspect and growth of the company. Um, you know, in working for a larger company, like you probably have a pretty prescribed role. Um, you may have other folks deciding like these are what the priorities are. This is what we're going to work on. And there's a lot more autonomy and independence and um, uh, space for people to be proactive and be like, all right, this is where my experience, you know, my background and knowledge is in. So I'm going to try and like affect, you know, the company's growth here. Like, I think this is where I can contribute. So you look at it, you're looking at like a lot more freedom um, and it's, it's just, it's very exciting. Um, and you're probably trading off, you know, a little security that maybe a, a government job or a, or a big corporate job would give you. Yeah, I tell people all the time. I've been involved in tech startups in Seattle like maybe 2015. It's just so much fun. I learned so much yes. stuff. Yeah, meet so many interesting people. Like I'm talking to people like you doing what? Right. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> what? Like you never want to be the smartest person in the room. Like yeah. you always want to be in the room where like people yeah. can teach you stuff and like just the people that I've encountered. Yeah, like people do some great stuff. Like, like brilliant. Well, yeah. I can't even think of how to be that smart. Right. I feel inadequate every day. <laughs> like, with, <laughs> like, like you, you invented what? Like you did what? Like. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a type of map, like let alone things. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do great stuff. So what's some of um, besides AI, is any tech out there that excites you? Ooh, uh, I think self-driving cars are pretty cool. Um, I think that's another, and I think we're in like this weird hybrid space right now where cars are starting to become more like computers that are modes of transportation, you know, where they have like safety features. You know, Tesla, of course, is like one of the, you know, primary ones. Um but like cars still need to be operated by humans. Yeah. Um, and, but we're, I think we're getting closer to uh, self-driving cars. And I think that's important for a couple reasons. One, that's just going to free up more time that the individual has um, for, you know, uh, rest, work, you know, spending time with their yeah. family um, where they're not operating the vehicle. And I believe as the technology improves, it's also going to improve safety on our roads, um, eliminate things, you know, like uh, drunk driving, you know, people being killed by drunk drivers, you know, vehicle accidents, uh, accidents with 18 wheelers, you know, those types of things, you know, vehicles hitting pedestrians. Um, and I hope to see, you know, like the safety of that just increase and then give people some more quality time back. Let's say some folks, someone has a self-driving car, I mean, Tesla's most popular one. They're at the bar, they've been drinking, they're drunk or whatever, they yeah. use the car. Please pull them over. Like do they still get a DUI, the car gets a DUI. Like they're, they're in the car, but they're, like the they're, they're not driving right. Right. Then maybe they're just gonna get like a I don't know, drunk in public. But, yeah. But uh, it's gonna require. I mean, it's gonna change transportation, and it's gonna change. I think like vehicle ownership and vehicle operation. Like maybe this is something where now you've got like a subscription to a car service, yeah. or um. But you're right. Like okay, so what are the policies now? If like you're you have a self-driving car you're drunk in it is it because like you could you could have manually overridden the car yeah. and like taken control or like so i think it's going to be like this comprehensive change to how we look at um driving and vehicle ownership so with all the advanced to take ai self-driving cars all the stuff going on you think the government's doing a good job of keeping pace with everything or they're like so far behind they have no clue what's going on um and and not to like dump on our government <laughs> but like and then the government is always i think working to catch up to regulate with like the rapid pace at which you know technology and human innovation is developing um and like technology i think we're on that kind of exponential growth of like the technology is just advancing faster and faster and faster and yeah, the government moves at the pace that it moves at and it should actually move at a measured pace like be a little afraid of a government that like moved like way too fast and could change like too rapidly. Um, so yeah, there's always going to be a catch up process in like regulating these advanced technologies. We see it in AI now, like it's an ungoverned space and they are looking, they, the government, 
is looking at, all right, how do you wisely regulate this where it doesn't stifle innovation? It just puts smart safety measures in place. Yeah, I think all average Americans were always like embarrassed when there was always a, a U.S. Congress, U.S. Senate tech meeting, whatever, and they had these tech presidents in front of them and they asked these, these questions like, are you kidding me, right? Do you have an intern? Like, don't you have like 25 year person on your staff that you could ask this question to first? Make sure it was like a legitimate one. Yeah, you just see such a variety of ages and experiences like in our elected officials, you know, and then it depends on like what the what the subject is. But you're right. Like so older folks that, you know, may not, you know, might be really, really new to them. They may not even have a computer on their desk in their office. But <laughs> so for Crete, what's what's y'all what's y'all success for next year? Ooh, um, all right, we're continuing to grow. Um, Nebula Social uh, is customer ready, and we are rapidly, you know, selling that in the commercial space. Um, we are always looking at um, taking on more government contracts um, on that on that side of the fence. Um, would love to see the company, you know, continue to grow in size um, and to scale across both government and commercial enterprise and like how do y'all like develop your product right do you like have a product market product, product roadmap y'all use like how do you develop your yeah we, we have a product roadmap um you know and it's a constant um process of of looking at it evaluating it um tweaking it as needed understanding like all right what are the features that would make what are the new and additional features that would make this like most usable like most attractive and that's user input, you know, that's customer input. It's, uh, you know, the engineers looking at, you know, what's within the realm of possible, like keeping up with other technology, you know, that comes out, you know, and, and, and remaining competitive, like those types of things. So yeah, product roadmap use, um, and looking at like what's next, um, is, is a constant process. And with y'all having locations all around the world, how do you manage like day-to-day -day workflows to be like, do y'all run on like DC time, India time? We do run mainly on East Coast time, um, but you're right. It, that, that's a challenge when you have um, a global workforce, you know, is if it's a if it's a meeting that, you know, needs the team in India, like we need to do it as early as possible in D in D.C. or New York um, so that the team in India is not doing it at 10 o'clock at night. But then also what if we're bringing in some of our West Coast team like then it's five in the morning for them. <laughs> Um, but I think that's, that's like the nature of how work is it's now business in 21st century it is. And that's why, you know, like tools, you know, that we have available for, you know, like people to be digital nomads and like to communicate like on Google, zoom, like all those things, um, are really valuable. Um, it makes it easier. It's still, it is still a challenge, you know? So when you are like hiring someone, suppose you're hiring for whatever job and you're interviewing people, what kind of characteristics or value you want your employees to have when they come on? Yeah. Um, so we love, of course, we, we love to see people that um, already have some experience in the tech industry, but that's not a requirement. And that, that would be more for like the technical type jobs. We're looking for people that are adaptable, that are resilient, uh, that are kind, um, that um, are going to thrive in an environment where there is some uncertainty and risk, um, but also like be good to their coworkers, you know, and work well on a team and work well on a, like a cross-functional team. Those are the really important, and I'm sure you see this working in HR. Um, those are, I don't want to call them soft skills. They're like harder to define skills. They don't always come across on a resume. They come across talking to people about their experiences, about what's been important to them, about previous projects they've worked on, like how they define success on it, that type of thing. Let's suppose someone's in your for a job with you. And you give them a job offer, another kind of gives them a job offer. Compensation, but like pretty much the same. Yeah. Everything the same, right? Responsibilities, job title, compensation. How do you convince them to accept your job offer versus the other one? Yeah. You'd look at stuff like um, office culture, company culture, um, you know, non-monetary benefits like, uh, you know, amount of paid time off. We have an unlimited time off policy. Um, thing, You know, offering things like... Um, you know, assistance with continuing education. Like we recently started a program with, you know, assisting with tuition. Um, if you're going to do a continuing education course, that's relevant um, to your position at Accrete. You know, like you can just request through your supervisor up to a certain amount, like, hey, I want to do this. Like in the company, you know, we'll take care of some of that. And that, that benefits both the employee and the company. I would hope that people would look at things like that. And as well as also like, I think our technology is freaking amazing. So it's like, yeah, I want to be, working on this like cutting edge uh, technology and like kind of 
in this rapidly changing space of AI. Those are all the things that I would look at. So how in the world, with all this stuff you have going on, how in the world do you have time to be a city council person? <laughs> like explain that one to us. Uh, and, be, and being a city council person for the town of Stephen City is like one of my great joys. Um, it's a pretty small town. It is a small town. It's, it's under 3,500 people. And I use that number because 3,500 as population is an important cutoff um, where a town will have to take over certain responsibilities from the state, you know, such as like road maintenance, those types of things. Um, so we're still smaller than that. We are rapidly growing because with the changing nature of the work, you know, work post COVID, we're close enough to DC and Northern Virginia that we've seen an explosion of subdivisions uh, in the past four years. Um, so how long that, have you been a council person? Uh, since two, 2022. Okay. Um, so I'm up for re-election re this year. I'm running out of post, so I hope I win. Oh, man. <laughs> because... <laughs> That'd be embarrassing. Really? Unopposed win. Nobody start a write-in campaign. <laughs> um, but uh, Is it a lot of fun for you, though? It is a, it is a lot of fun. It is a time commitment. You're right. Um, we have a town staff who, of course, is doing, like, the day-to-day. -day. We have a public works department. Um, so the council is is all volunteer. Same with the, the mayor is a volunteer position as well. Our mayor is a veteran. He's a Navy veteran. Um, but because I moved around so much in the military for 20 years, I was both missing a sense of belonging to a certain place. And the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia is an incredibly beautiful place and a wonderful place to live. Stephen City is a phenomenal town. Um, and I also knew I was going to be leaving behind a sense of community when I left the military. And that's what like no one left behind does for me. That's what being part of a Crete does for me. That's what being part of town council does for me is I still have a purpose and I'm still like, I have a, a strong identity with like my community and my fellow town council members with my fellow board members and staff on no one left behind. And I think that's really important to us veterans as, as we leave the yeah. service. So as a city council person, how do you have to deal with like, you know, some random citizen calling you up, hey, um, like, I mean, I hate to say like random complaints, but you know, like stuff like, okay. Oh yeah, there's complaints all the time, you know, like. like why are you calling me for, you know? <laughs> um, and, and like to our town staff's credit, they are the ones that get the bulk of that because when you look on the website and like you can go to the office and call the number, like that's what it is. Like um, as a town council member, there's some of that, but there's also like, so much of the reward of like, like we recently started a veterans banner program in town in conjunction with some of the other towns around us um, because we didn't have it before. You know how you drive through like a small town main street and there'll be the commemorative banners of veterans of all generations. Um, so we, we started that last year. This is our second year. Um, and it's been really popular within the community, like people nominating their spouses, their parents, you know, themselves, um, the, the, community got me a banner like the other town council members and that really really touched me um so so yeah it's, it's so is this like an older community like middle age like what's the demographic as well as age and that kind of stuff so we've seen the demographic shift just since i've lived there because um winchester used to and still does have a large manufacturing base like that was you know the industry in town um there's also the uh you know there's a lot of orchards there's still a lot of farming in the area but that's declining so I would say 10 years ago, you would still see that it was probably an older agricultural or manufacturing um, type population um, that was probably aging as people like, you know, moved to cities for, for work and stuff. Um, but post COVID, um, there's been a return to younger families and everything, having the ability to move to the area and have, you know, a bigger house, a bigger yard than they might living right in the city, but that are earlier in their career or mid-career. So the population is is starting to trend younger again okay. uh, and as like a family-friendly area. So I saw this on the news like two days ago. So I think it's Missoula, Montana, right? So the main thing is that it's like lumber, right? But during COVID, people went to Missoula and like paid all this high money for houses, right? Yeah. And so now the people that actually live there can't afford housing. So leaving at all these places or like can't find anyone to work because obviously someone rich comes there, not going to work at like a lumber factory, right? Right. Is there anything like that going on in your town? Um, we have definitely seen an increase, increase in home prices. Um, so compared to, you know, like what 
we bought our farm for in 2016. Our farm is 18 acres, you know, with a three bedroom house and a hundred year old house, but a three bedroom house um, and outbuildings and everything. Um, what we bought it for is now less than the price of like a starter home in a subdivision. Um, and is almost becoming to what like new townhouses are priced at. So yes, there is that like, and I think that does create an impact on the community where, all right, you know, what you could have purchased as a, as a home here seven or eight years ago, like it's doubled almost. And I think that's going on across yeah. the U S in a lot of places. So let's suppose there's a family moving to your area, right? They have a decent job. And the thing about moving to your city, how do you convince them that they move your city? You'll be more like, no, take it with the DC. We have, we have enough people here. Go to DC. No, I'm in, I'm in like the inclusive, you know, like <laughs> obviously I'm involved in like immigration, you know, I'm like, yeah, oh, come on. Like, you know, like the more, the better, like, you know, like, um, no, I, I think the growth is a good thing. Um, I, so I like seeing, you know, what things incentivize families to move there. Like, you know, it's the school systems, it's after school activities available, it's restaurants, it's, um, you know, parks, you know, and those types of things, you know, access to uh, recreation, that type of thing, um, as well as like, you know, a welcoming environment. Um, so yeah, I, I love to see, you know, our area growing. I think it's very exciting. So if you had to do it over again, would you do 20 years in the army again, or you not get in, or you do, or you do four, six years? No, we you know now. I would 100% uh, join again. Um, I mean, I think it improved me as a person. Like, I mean, it was, uh, very impactful to my life, you know, like as far as like, you just helping me understand the world, making me a better person, making me, you know, a gentler person. Like, um, I think that was really important. Like, and I think any type of service doesn't have to be military service, but I think young people need to experience some type of, you know, being part of something bigger than yourself, contributing to something that doesn't maybe like directly benefit you. Um, 20 years, that's a hard uh, you know, you're going you to get a tech startups and all this exciting stuff, you know, stuff out there. I'm like, I might have rather started that at 30 instead of 40. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I joined right before September 11th. And so I was a lieutenant uh, when September 11th happened. And then I was a platoon leader in the initial invasion into Iraq in 2003. Um, and those were unparalleled adventures. I mean, they, they were very hard and sometimes tragic. Um, uh, but I mean, just unbelievable experiences with incredible people. And I definitely would not trade that. Like, um, and the retirement is nice now. Yeah. Also. That's one thing now, like, I don't know a clue how the new timer works, but it just seems like it is not worth it to retire 20 years now with this new retirement. I mean, I don't know. It just seems like it's not worth it anymore. Right. And I, I think as, as night, you know, and I'm benefiting from the, you know, work exactly. 20 years and then have yeah. your retirement start, but there's a lot of value in a blended system because, and you're not just having, it's like all or nothing, like make it to 20 or you get nothing. Yeah. Like, um, it's, it's helping people be more in control of yeah. their fate. I mean, people have the discipline to do that though. Basically, the E4, like, I'm going to, I'm going to, so you want me to choose between spending 50 bucks on a club and a case of beer versus my future? I think yeah. beer wins every time. Right. And I think that's where, like, leaders um, have a responsibility to, like, try and, you know, say, like, hey, these are some decisions that may not seem important now, but here's where it will, um, you know, positively benefit you in the long run. And then, like, you know, turn it over to the 18 to 24 year olds to make the choices that they make. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so next, let's go back to a no, no one left behind. Yeah. On that one, can you do a deeper dive, like how it got started, what you're focused on now with the business for it? Yes, absolutely. So no one left behind started in 2013 when our founder, Janice Shinwari, um, arrived here to the U.S. on the special immigrant visa program. Uh, Janice had worked with the U.S. Army for years. He had saved several soldiers, um, so several soldiers' lives. And when he arrived, um, his unit that he had worked with had raised some money for his family, but he experienced what I think um, a lot of folks experienced, particularly in those early days. Like he arrived and he thought like, okay, um, you know, I served with the U.S. military, like was eligible for this visa program. Where are the programs that like benefit, you know, like my type of community to like help us, you know, get restarted here. And there was 
no programs at the time. Um, so he founded No One Left Behind with the money that um, the, his army comrades had raised to help him restart his life here in the U.S. Um, and for the first several years, uh, we were involved with um, advocacy for the Special Immigrant Visa Program and resettlement. Um, and then it was only during the events in August of 21 that evacuation became a very important pillar as well. And the next, the same thing for Create AI, how it got yeah. started, what you focus on now, and the big dream vision for it going forward, so to speak. Yeah, so a Crete AI started in 2017. Uh, our founder and CEO, Prashant Boyan, uh, came out of the uh, financial sector. He was a, a quant, he was a, a high-frequency trader, um, and you know was looking at trying to solve that problem of like, how can I, or a trader like me, absorb massive amounts of information and make very, very fast decisions where like a second or less than a second is, will give me an edge over, you know, somebody else. Um, so that's how Accrete started. Um, and he has experience in like, you know, creating software products, starting companies. Um, in 2019, uh, they looked at uh, competing for a government contract and realized that, all right, the competing, you know, and like the government acquisitions process is this whole giant monster of its own. And then in 2020, they decided to start the federal side of the business to be deliberate about pursuing the government as a customer. In addition to having our commercial products, um, one of our first successful products was with the music industry. It was called The Vibe. Um, and it, what it looked at is, you know, you've got hundreds of thousands of videos, you know, being uploaded maybe every hour now to the internet um, through all different types of platforms, you know, being followed by real influencers, regular people, bots, who knows what, how could a record label or a talent scout sort through all that and find someone that is actually trending, you know, like, key influencers are saying this is important. This isn't just a bot farm that's following them. How are you finding, um, you know, talent in all these things that are all these videos that are being uploaded, you know, so many times a day. Um, so that was the first product. And that's kind of what some of our other products have grown out of. Um, the federal team stood up in 2020. We competed through the defense uh, innovation unit um, and got uh, a grant through them or, you know, were awarded some money through them to build this prototype that became Argus Supply Chain. And we were one of the first companies where that became a full-on production contract uh, for the government. Yeah, I remember the first time I learned that people could buy followers that blew my mind. Like, oh, how, yeah, yeah. Like, like, how is that not illegal? Or, or, bot farm or, in Estonia. Yeah, like, how, how is it not illegal or unethical, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> it blew my mind. So next, um, talk about how you take your health. With the add-on complexity of being a 20-year Army veteran, with all the mental stuff we go through and the physical stuff we go through, talk about how you take care of your health, whether physically, mentally, spiritually, or whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, you, you realize, like, how much that increases in importance, like, as you start to age. Um, for me, I would say, like, mentally and physically, the farm is what really grounds me. Um, and whatever a person has, whatever hobby, like, brings you a lot of peace, but also, like, for me, it's it's a physical outlet. Like I'm doing uh, all the work on the farm. Like, no, I'm not there this week. So my parents are doing all the work on the farm. Um, but also just the piece that comes with like, to me, being with animals is incredibly relaxing. Um, and like I said, it's also grounding. Like, you know, I may be stressed out from work or no one left behind. And then just, you know, feeding the horses late at night um, and tucking them in. Uh, really keeps me like focused and, and in a good spot. And then, you know, I think uh, for veterans, staying abreast of, of like the health issues that are developing, particularly for those of us uh, that served in the Middle East and Iraq and Afghanistan who may have burn pit exposure. Um, for me, I've had um, a type of skin cancer, it's more benign type uh, uh, since 2008 um, that is constantly being treated, you know, new patches of it are like found. Um, and I believe it's related to burn pit exposure. Um, so just staying on top of those types of things, um, and really taking your wellness as like something that you are actively doing for yourself, like to increase your quality of life. Yeah. I know one thing, like when I was in the military, I probably did some stupid stuff. Like, you know, like one time I did a row march for the 
pretty much a broken foot, you know. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, now you think back, what the fuck was I doing, right? You're paying for that now. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. You know, you gotta be. You can't be a punk, especially an officer. Like you can't do stuff your people not doing right. right. And man, I don't. I mean, that mentality is good, I think, to an extent. But man, it's like sometimes it changes. Maybe it has changed. I've been out for a long time. It is hard on the body. I mean, that is a line of work that I mean breaks people down. Like, and it, it is you know the immense physicality um involved with being in the military um particularly in in deployed environments you know where you're like wearing a lot of body armor like you're in uncomfortable situations you know like um so yeah it it breaks the body down faster than maybe perhaps you know someone who wasn't in that type of environment yeah i'm a big believer that if anyone does like three or four years they should automate at 30 percent like even if they did if that's the Five days a week, running on a cement for three, four years. Right, yeah. You get 30%. Your, that, right? your joints at 40 are going to be the joints of a 70-year-old. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, so um, what else do you do for fun? Oh, uh, like I love to write, like okay. I said. So I have been working on a novel about the first year in Iraq. Um, and I know you and I have like a shared military police background. Um, I wanted to write about what a military police platoon is going through um going into iraq and the the reason i wanted to write it is because when i was in high school um in the 90s considering a career in the military there wasn't a lot of literature that i could find that had an example uh where the woman was the military member or like even uh biographies um you know the vietnam war was just a little, a little over 20 years behind us at that point. Um, and a lot of those biographies and accounts, you know, were understandably from, from the male perspective. And I read those like voraciously, um, at, you know, as well as other, you know, like fictional and nonfiction accounts. But um, I wanted to put something out there um, that maybe a young woman could read uh, and have a protagonist, um, and the protagonists in the story are younger. They're younger enlisted. They're, you know, 19, 20 years old um, of what it was like, you know, just what is the military experience like? Um, and the author that I hold up uh, as a great example of that is Walter Dean Myers, um, who wrote specifically for young men of color um, to tell them, you know, as a young adult, you know, author, you know, like, hey, here's what the military experience is like. So you did 20 years as an empty police officer, military police officer. It was FBI Academy. You had no desire when you got out to become like the chief of police system of the city or work for the FBI. You just like, you wanted a clean break, no more. God bless law enforcement professionals, but I knew towards the end of my career, it was not, it it, it was not for me. Okay. Um, Working CID at then Fort Bragg, now Fort Liberty. um, it, It just, law enforcement is tough. You know, law enforcement investigations, you know, are very hard, you know, mentally and emotionally on, the, you know, the, on the law enforcement officials themselves. Um, and it just, it was enough to do it in the military. It wasn't something that I saw as a future career for me. I knew I wanted um, just a different, a different type of excitement. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about something in your military career that you're thinking about, like, is, is like either like you're really proud of, you just had a fun time doing it. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. Let me, let me think for a second. Um, well, I had, I, I had always wanted to be a paratrooper. And so I was delighted uh, and I fought hard for this assignment to go to Fort Bragg and to be in the 82nd um, when I was a captain. And so I went to airborne school as a captain. Um, And it was kind of funny, like, uh, and only four women graduated in my class. Um, You know, a lot of people drop during airborne school. It's not a particularly hard school, Um, but I think it's, it's just like mentally like, can I wrap my head around, do I want to fall out of airplanes like, or not? Um, so I went, I had a, I had a great time. Um, I joined the 82nd. It was when fourth brigades, fourth BCTs were standing up across the army. Uh, they were creating uh, a fourth brigade in a lot of divisions. Um, so I was one of the first officers assigned to uh, what became our fourth brigade at the 82nd. Um, that brigade ended up deploying to Afghanistan within about six months of the brigade being created. Um, so it was rapidly fielded, rapidly filled with, you know, people. We went through a rapid train up period, you know, went to JRTC and then deployed for a 15 month tour to Afghanistan. Um, and that was probably one of my most 15 months is a long time, you know, and 
Um, this was 2007, like Afghanistan was a little bit of the forgotten war at the time. All the focus was on Iraq. Um, you know, it was a violent time period. Um, but just, I w served with amazing people. Um, some of our ambassadors, Ahmad um, and Ishmael Khan, who's here in Seattle, um, also were interpreters um, for the for 4th Brigade of the 82nd. Now, we didn't um, know that coming into No One Left Behind. It was more like we figured it out, you know, just like veterans everywhere are like, oh, were you here at this time frame? Like, you look familiar. Uh, and we realized that shared connection. So uh, those 15 months in Afghanistan with the 82nd um, were really, really impactful. And I got to, uh, I got to finally be a paratrooper for a small <laughs> period of my career. Nice. So quickly talk about the challenges of, of getting out of the Army, right? Because like, okay. I joke around, like, most of us have no idea what a private does or a general does, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they have no clue what we do, right? Can you talk about the culture shock or process of, like, going through that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I got out of the Army during COVID, which, like, that was a culture shock in and of itself, just like the whole world, you know, in the country was like trying to figure out what was going on. Um, but it made um, job interviewing um, and all those things like an extra level of challenging. And I have found for myself, and I think some other veterans go through this, like I will like swing wildly between like what, what I think I'm capable of and like what I'm afraid I'm not capable of. So it's like, sometimes I'm scared. I'm like, what if I lose my job? Like, what am I going to do? Like, you know, I'm going to go have to work at the grocery store or something like, I don't even like, I can't even imagine like, well, you know, what am I qualified to do now? Um, and that's not reality. That's like the imposter syndrome talking. Um, but it's also a little bit because we're taking a career that is hard to translate into civilian um, terms, you know, into the civilian equivalent of positions. And it's like, well, how do I, I do have 25 years of work experience now. It feels to me, because I've only been out for a few years, that I only have a few years of work experience, but that's not true. But how do I demonstrate and articulate, all right, you know, if I was an S1 for an MP battalion, how does that translate as like an HR professional? Or if I was the um, XO, the executive officer of a CID battalion, like what, what does that mean as far as now being director of operations of a company of comparable size? Like they're very similar and it's like, but how it, it's an ongoing challenge to to articulate it. And, the, it, you know, it's also tough up here mentally. You're not explaining. You're not just explaining it to uh, the people that you're going to work for. You're trying to help yourself understand yeah. it. So do you have any like personal career goals coming up? Like, do you want to be start your own company one day, be the VP of Microsoft or or you're like, you know, I did 20 years of Army. I was an Army officer. I do not want to start my own company. I'm happy to work for another company because I've seen how difficult it is to, yeah, to start your own company. It is like, and a lot of startups fail. And I am so proud of us that like we have not failed and we're an older startup. Um, I want to publish this novel. That's an important career goal to me. Um, I want to stay engaged and challenged in what I'm doing at Accrete. Like, I don't have a specific goal there other than just like, I want to see my own personal growth continue in a way that like contributes to the company. Um, I still have my GI Bill left. I'd love to use seriously? that. I seriously. How do you pull uh, that off? So I got my, oh, cause I don't, I don't have kids. I didn't give it away to anyone. Um, That's a good point. And I, my, I got my master's degree uh, while I was still in the military and used tuition assistance. Um, you, so, you have all of it left. I got all of it left. You get like two or three PhDs, can't you? Heck yeah. And like, you know, maybe I want to go, go learn product development or learn how to code AI or something. It, exactly. Like I thought about like, all right, do I use it? That's a good option to have. Cause I, I stumbled into this like emerging tech field with no STEM background, um, and feel really lucky to be here and understanding it in a way that like maybe the current population doesn't have, but like, I want to remain competitive and like. I want to understand, you know, the the technology that I'm in. Um, so do I get it in something related to AI or do I get it in something like in something I love? Like I'm going to go study like English literature, yeah. you know, in Oxford for <laughs> a year or so. That'd be interesting. Like, yeah. I don't think I could leave the farm that long. But no. Yeah. So you have one retirement from the Army. You ever see yourself like permanently retiring, or, like being on the farm 24 seven, not working, just like chilling out with the cats and horses and bees? Um, at some point, I would love to become financially independent enough to 
really, really focus full time on the things that I love, like no one left behind um, or writing. Um, so that would mean having you write enough passive income or retirement or savings um, to do that. Um, I'd also still like to travel a lot. So that means like paying for help at the farm. But yeah, I would. I like I don't want to, um, you know, work in an office until I drop dead at 90 someday. Yeah. Like I want to <laughs> I want to like have adventures like in the last what, few decades of your, life. What's like a place you want to travel to you haven't been to yet? I really want to go to Scotland oh. and I want to go to Mongolia. Mongolia? That's yeah. Great. So there's um, there is a horse race that takes place in Mongolia. Yeah. Um, I think I heard of this. Uh, the Mongolian Derby. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you have to you have to apply and it costs like fifteen thousand dollars to enter. Um, but it takes place over a number of days and you're riding um, local horses. Um, and so it's really, you know, adventure tourism. Um the you know that you don't win anything from the horse race other than maybe like a little bit of notoriety for the, for the people that follow those types of yeah. things um but it's more about the experience um you know and horses are so important to my life as well as like that type of adventure mindset that i'd love to do something like that and then being of scottish irish descent i would yeah. love to go to scotland someday and explore so outside the military travel course you've done a lot of traveling besides that uh, I have. Yeah, I've got, you're right. Got to travel with the military, um, but have also had chances to vacation in Europe, uh, to go to uh, Africa. Um, when I worked as a congressional fellow uh, for Congressman Steve Israel, we took a trip uh, to Egypt. Um, and that was just, that was an incredible experience. So what's the place you travel to where you're like, just had a fantastic time, great time, whatever. But most people are like, are you sure? There's no way you had a good time here. Like, no, I don't believe you. Okay, so it was, it was with the military. Uh, so I don't know if that counts. But um, my first deployment was to Djibouti, Africa. And I actually didn't know that was a country in 2002 when they told us we were deploying there. Um, and that was such a different experience for me. And meeting, um, so the German military has had a presence there for years, and so is the French Foreign Legion, um, as well as there's now a lot of like Chinese and other Middle Eastern influence in Djibouti. Um, and understanding why that was an important, you know, place in Africa and like what, um, you know, is a deep water port. Uh, yeah, so saying like, well, I had, I had this amazing, you know, six month long experience in Djibouti, Africa, and still a lot of people will be like, where's Djibouti again? <laughs> Nice. And um, so you say your dad's watching, right? I think so. You want to give him a quick shout out? Yeah. Hey, mom and dad, like, uh, thanks for everything. Thanks for watching the farm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. So um, is there anything I should have asked you that happened or anything else you want to talk about? Um, We have covered a lot of ground. Are there some things that, that you like to talk about that we didn't sufficiently cover? Um, now that you mentioned it, you were like a congressional li liaison or something, right? Yeah. Can you talk about that experience? Yes. So, um, and is that like a, were you in the military this time? Post I was in the military. Um, so the military, um, in partnership with Congress, um, has the congressional fellow program. And that's to, that's because, you know, the executive branch and the legislative branch like work so closely, um, that there are about a hundred military fellows on the Hill working in congressional offices every year. And that provides that kind of direct link and understanding between the executive branch and the legislative branch. So I applied when I was leaving that 15 month tour in Afghanistan that I told you about. Um, I applied to be a congressional fellow and I was accepted and I went to work for an incredible person, Congressman Steve Israel uh, from Long Island. Uh, he is now retired. Um, he retired undefeated and unindicted. He likes to say he served several successful tours in Congress and then chose to step out of the game and uh, operates a bookstore um, on Long Island now. He is a published author. He's involved with a number of national security think tanks and education. Um, and to me, that was the year working in his office was so fascinating to understand how our legislative branch operates that then I remained for most of the rest of my career involved in um legislative liaison work. So I, I had that period of time where I went to the FBI National Academy and then was a CID XO. But really, for the most part, I was working um, as a liaison to like the Armed Services Committee or to the Defense Appropriations Committee on Army issues. Um, and it was incredible work, like really, really enjoyed that. 
So when I was in the Army, I did HR. So I kind of know how the Army HR works like. So when I was in Korea, I signed every officer in Korea, you know, unless they were brigade, brigade or battalion commander. Yeah. When I was 2ID, I signed every person there, right? So I know how it kind of works. We're HRC all the times. So basically, you told me, right? So you got this FBI Academy thing. Yeah. You got to be top notch. I'm guessing this thing would be top notch. When it's time to retire, how bad did they keep try to keep? I have to imagine they did everything to keep you in. I had to imagine they put out all the stops. Um, At least that, that, that's all I presume. That so, so I did not command a battalion. Um, and the reason I didn't is because I was really happy in what I was doing legislative affairs wise that I resisted the MP Corps prescribed career path. Okay. Um, to stay in legislative assignments. And I always had the support of like the general officers that I worked for. Um, because you don't good things, so you're making them look good. But when you when you self-select out of commanding that's true. On like a on normal army officer. Yeah, take off the top block. Right. Well, they're, yeah, they're like, okay, yeah, like so you're not gonna make 06 in the MP Corps because you know you've chosen the career path. I was like, I was completely okay with that. Okay. Like that to me was like I was steering my career in the direction I wanted to what was important to me and still like contributing in a way I thought like, all right, this is where my gifts are um, versus like yielding to the pressure of like, all right, you need to follow like the prescribed military police corps career path. Um, so no, they didn't, they didn't try that hard to like okay. keep me in. I mean, like personal leaders that I knew were like, are you sure you want to get out? Like, you know, I think you still have a lot to give, you know, or, um, but I was ready to go. Okay. Yeah. So how long did you work in Congress? Oh, gosh. Uh, from starting the fellowship in 2009, then working with NATO training mission in Afghanistan. And then I had my hiatus to work with, uh, or not hiatus, to go back to the MP Corps and work um, in CID command. Um, and then from 2015 onward to 2020, I was in D.C. as a legislative okay. uh, liaison. So what do most regular Americans don't realize about how Congress works? Um, I think most Americans don't realize the annual cyclical nature of legislation, particularly when it comes to, you know, there's a difference between what is being authorized and then what money is actually being appropriated for programs. And they're two separate pieces of legislation. So if, you know, an average Americans like, oh, you know, like, I don't think our defense department should be spending money on this. Like, well, there's a window of time throughout the year when like that can be influenced and it's influenced by like, all the different government departments and like individual, you know, lobbying groups and that type of thing. Um, and then that legislation becomes law and then the cycle starts again. Um, so kind of understanding like how you can plug in and be involved and like shape, um, you know, the issues that you care about and where access is, like where you can influence it. Um, that's what I think most average, what most Americans don't understand. And when you get that insight, like then I've really enjoyed being able to share that with like the companies that I work for, um, that type of thing. Like, hey, here's, you want to make a difference? Like, here's how, you know, the annual cycle works. Like, here's how you can make a difference, like right here. So from your experience, who actually runs the government? Is it like actually elected officials, the quote unquote bureaucracy or the lobbyists or, or the American? Combination people? of all three. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's the elected officials. It is the committee staff. It's the personal staff that works for the elected officials. It's the businesses and entities that have a presence in the districts, you know, uh, across America. And then it's um, interest groups of Americans, you know, that are letting their voice be heard like, hey, you know, this this matter is important to us, you know, grassroots types efforts. So it really it's it's a combination like I mean, it's a complex as it should be, um, you know, ecosystem. Let's suppose like this next the twenty twenty four election. Suppose a uh, Tom Brown newly elected from the from a district of say Nebraska, right? Yeah. How much of a disadvantage is he as as a first term congressman versus someone who's been there like 10, 20 years? So, uh, and this is the reason um, that I, I that I that the congressman I worked for, Congressman Israel, mentioned one of the reasons he retired is because the two year term of a congressman is so short that you're really going into like active fundraising and reelection efforts within a year of, of that term. Um, and the money raising cycle and the cost of elections and reelections is so exhausting that yes, an incumbent or someone who has been there for many years 
and already has those established relationships, those established, you know, donors, that type of thing, like that sphere of influence, like that's a posi- coming from a position of power versus someone who's who's like starting, you know, from scratch, like, and so it is a shame, I think, that so much attention for elected officials has to be placed on re-election and fundraising versus serving the districts that they represent. And I, I think many of them are fed up with that. Like they would much rather be doing the work of running the country and, you know, um, helping their districts that they represent. And instead, our political machine, you know, has people endless cycles of fundraising and re-election. And then obviously, like, I could be wrong, of course, you have to think you have your fundraising right. And someone says, give you $20 million. You can sell all you want. It doesn't affect your decision-making process. But it has to be in the back of your mind, right? I mean, it's has to. I think it's just human nature. If someone gives you $20 million to say, hey, you know, I'm not going to tell you to vote, but um, I am your big supporter. And if you voted this way, it'll help me out. I'm sure they'll say it like that, of course, you know. Okay, so but- let's, let's pull out this on this thread a little bit. Like somebody, a company, because, um, you know, there's individual campaign restrictions and what you can donate. But like, um, a pack or something, you know, gave uh, a member a large donation. And why would that be? It's because, you know, they represent, you know, a certain industry in the district, you know, and maybe it's a a defense in- industry that builds tanks, we'll say, or something, you know, some large piece of equipment. Um, they were able to give that amount of money and they chose to give that amount of money because they are a big, you know, influential factor in the district, you know, whether it's a lot of employment, you know, a lot of, you know, revenue for the district. Um, So of course you're right. Then that's going to shape like, well, I need to keep this manufacturing, this production line open um, in my district because it's providing like thousands of jobs to the the people in my area. Like it's, it's what, you know, sustains um, this district. But what if the department of defense's priority shift and they're like, Oh, we don't need that many up armored vehicles this year. Like, so we're just, just shut that production line down. Like, we don't need those vehicles. Well, like, yeah. you can't shut down a manufacturing plant production line and then just like stand it back up yeah. again. Like, you have to keep it going. Um, that's the kind of dilemmas that they face. And also, too, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm cynical. So I'm sure this goes on. Like, back to the scenario, a, a donor says, "Hey, remember the ten million dollars I gave you? If you don't do it like I want, it's going to go to your opponent, right?" You know, like I'm yeah, sure that happens unfortunately. You know, right? I guess that, yeah. Those are those choices that they face, and that's like what kind of trade offs. The dirty you know? part of politics. Everyone wants to think we're living this in a fantasy world where the best ideas win, and you know, right. all that kind of stuff. But it's not the real world, right? Yeah. Mm-mm. You ever miss working in Congress? Um, I'm really happy with what I'm doing now. Oh, yeah. Um, but there is something exciting about being involved in like the operation of the country. Um, so I don't quite miss it, but I really value the experience I had there. So back to no one left behind is the plan is always to stay focused on that. You think I'll ever expand like other immigration things or, or any other items you just only stay focused on what you're doing now. So we want to stay focused on the special immigrant visa program right now. That is for Afghanistan and Iraq. And we understand that, like, let's say the U S withdrawals from Iraq, we should probably plan for not. We should probably plan. We are planning actively for what if we suddenly have a large population of Iraqi interpreters coming here? You know, right now it's just, you know, 50 or so every year. Um, But we want to see this become a global program. So wherever the U.S. deploys and works with interpreters and, you know, local nationals from a country, like let's, you know, Syria, Yemen, you know, um, we want that program to expand to cover those folks as well. One thing, I don't, I don't think most Americans realize how many countries were in, in the military, right? Like, they have no clue, like, where we're at or, like, right. like they have no no clue at all, right? I think it was surprising to people when we pulled out from Afghanistan. Like, a lot of people were like, I we're did not there. realize we were still there. there. Yeah. I thought we killed Obama, like, right. summer, What like, are we still doing? Yeah. yeah what are we still doing here? Yeah. yeah. Same mistake. with Iraq. You know, I mean, there's still a U.S. presence in Iraq. We pulled out, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to talk about? No, this was wonderful. Thanks cool, for the thanks. chance to come on and right. talk about these things. So I if we get about. out of here, uh, can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Oh, gosh. Um, focus on putting good into the world, you know, like whether, you know, it's what you're working on that you're passionate about, you know, areas like No One Left Behind for me, which is where I feel like I'm really making a contribution. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of happiness can be derived from like feeling like you're making a difference. And finally, how can people reach out to you either for 
no one left behind, a creek, your city council person. What's the best way to people reach out? Yeah, to? absolutely. Uh, well, I always encourage people to go to the no one left dot org website um, and you can find all types of information there about like the advocacy efforts that we talked about. You can make a donation there. Uh, I've got a link there to my bio. And so you can reach out to me or any members of the board and staff there. Um, or you can go to the accrete.ai website and see about our really exciting artificial intelligence technology. Um, yeah. Or come visit me in Stephen City, Virginia. <laughs> Thanks, Mara. I really appreciate your time today. It was great to meet you. Thanks for this. To our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.